Hey! Hey, I can't hear you, buddy. You're muted. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Okay, can you do sign language? Don't give me the one sign that you always give me, that one finger that of yours. I, want, I need a, a little bit of audio from you. Hello, everybody. In the meantime, when Angelo is uh, setting up his audio, we were running through some difficult, uh, technical difficulties with Angelo's laptop. I might have crapped out, and, and then uh, we got him going video-wise. Well, you know what? I kind of like this, Ange. I can see you, but I don't have to listen to your bullshit. <laughs> see, he's yelling at me. I can't hear him. I love it. Whoever did that, you're a genius, a technical genius. Um, so Ange is obviously going through. He's just changed laptops. He just went through a, um, a laptop change. And I think we will get him going here in, in the near future. I don't know how how we can do it and that. But every, everybody else, welcome to the show. We see the, the list is growing uh, along our sidelines quite nicely. Um, I hope everybody had a, a good week. It's been a week since we broadcast last. And uh, and I think this week we're going to have a lot of fun because our guest is a, is not only a, a man in the fishing business, but he's a he's a friend of Angelo's and myself. He's a good friend, a good buddy of mine. He, uh, he, uh, he and I spent some time on the boat together uh, doing uh, some more bass fishing than anything. Like, uh, the, the, ben is a bass fisherman, that's for sure. But he's really broadening himself now. He's got a lot of projects uh, on the go, uh, national, not say nationally, but he's, he's definitely far away from us right now. So it's, uh, it's going to be a good show, I believe. Very well-spoken dude, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't know how many people we got going on there now. I see Angela's still not in there. In case, in case, I'm going to do a little bit, cut a little bit of time right now before the, before the guests. See if we can get Ange in. And, and in the meantime, this week on FishingCanada.com, we were going to do this towards the end, but we're going to do this now. Look at all my notes in the back of this, by the way. That's crazy. So uh, uh, Pete reflects on his Ontario Bass opening day experience with a detailed written account and over 20 minutes of POV footage. We have uh, we're just starting to do a little bit of different shooting now that this COVID has set in on Ange and I and has taken away from our normal shooting procedures. Hey. Hey, hello. It's working now. We're hearing you, buddy. We're hearing you. Okay. So, well, very quickly, just right. quickly add to the end of that, right. in that we we're, uh, we're just putting some POV cameras on. We're doing a lot of different stuff just to try and uh, stay up with stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So our, our new style of shooting is not taking away. We're not getting rid of the fishing canvas canvas style of shooting. We're just going to add to it sort of thing. So give me a You're doing a great job, Peter. Keep, keep tap dancing, buddy. Okay, buddy. I can bring I can bring Ben in any time if you want. <laughs> you, give me a check. Give me a check one two. Give me your sound audio. Let me hear. Here, it. one two three four five six seven eight. You're a thing of beauty now. Look at me. Look at hey. you, Jimmy. Wow. Give me, me. give me a little less headroom now. If you can just tilt that camera down a little bit, bit then we got there. That's beautiful. Look at you. Okay, you're in camo. I can't see you now. What the I know you can. I thought I'd disguise myself. Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, you know, one of those things. I, I, uh -oh. I, we, we get it in radio. I didn't think we'd get it here on uh, on webcasting, but every once in a while when we do live radio, it, it happens. Something was wrong. So, uh, do, you a, do you need a new laptop now? Is that a, is that a did you blow out your laptop? It looked like it because I, oh, I, I, I was using it right up until we went, uh, what, five minutes to go, and then all of a sudden the thing just went black. The whole thing you see, you see, what, see what happens when you watch all that porn on your uh, laptop, buddy? It, it's going to finally get you. <laughs> That's it. Um, I don't know how far you've gone. I, I did want to say a couple of quick things uh, before we get started with today's guest. Boy, it's been a, a crazy week in the fishing industry. First of all, I don't know whether you, you talked about it yet or not, Pete, about uh, those three anglers down in Florida this nope, week. Did not, did not touch on it yet. It was coming up at, at some time, so we can do it either early, later, or right now. No problem. I can do it now. I'm just going to close my door here. My door's still, my tech guys are going in and out. <laughs> no, you know, they all bailed on you. So again, on the on uh, fishingcanada.com, you'll see these two stories now. The first one was uh, an unfortunate happening in Florida, down by Polk, uh, the Polk area, uh, Polk County in Florida, where three anglers were murdered believe it or not, uh, three young guys murdered uh, on a fishing trip, on a weekend fishing trip. It was a Friday night or something like that. And uh, and unfortunately, they got murdered. But now the fortunate thing, that if there is such a thing, is that there's already been three suspects uh, arrested. Uh, and I'm sure they got to go through the whole trial thing now that but it's uh the one the one's a real badass is one let's let's be honest he's an idiot the one guy has 200 and something charges felony charges i've heard or something like that 
at, and he's 20 something years old, I believe it is. So this, this guy was obviously destined to uh, be in jail the rest of his life, uh, you know, a low life of all, of all low lives and all that. So luckily they have found these people. I mean, these are three guys that are going out on a fishing trip, a weekend fishing trip and getting murdered. Uh, I mean, that's just, just insane. So we have the full stories uh, and links to the full stories on fishingcanada.com. So if you haven't seen it yet, you should check it out because it's uh, it's yeah. scary. And, and I'm proud to say we kind of got the scoop up here on the uh, on the arrests because I, it just hit mainstream media this morning. I read about it in the uh, in the Sun this morning, and we broke it yesterday. I think around two o'clock that they yeah. had actually. Did that. Well, that's the beauty of the internet. Now that story we found late. The first story we found late. Posted it up. As soon as we posted it up, we started getting comments. People are good people here are commenting. And then somebody else had heard, hey, we heard that there was an arrest. So then we looked into that. So thank you very much for keeping us abreast, too. And as long as we keep you abreast, we'll all work together. A couple of new things we're adding as we go along. We're going to uh, talk to you uh, each week about a, a new hot spot that we post on fishingcanada.com. Uh, this week, uh, the new hot spot that's being posted is uh, Shawanigan Lake in British Columbia. And, and the other one's called Shawanigan Lake. I got one too. <laughs> well, I want to do them both. Why waste them? What are you doing one this week and one next week? So Wenigan Lake. Where the hell? Sh keep up with those shenanigans, and you're going to be gone again. Okay. <laughs> uh, great body of water. Uh, it was one of our first trips to BC when we were. Yeah. We had heard that there was uh, largemouth bass fishing out out west. Yeah. So we did this, uh, this. This. I think it was a ten day ordeal out there. We went searching and hunting, and, and, and boy, did we ever find bass, largemouth and smallmouth, both. Yeah, that, 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 that really surprised us. That Shawnigan, I mean, that's that's a, a smallmouth fishery, like a good, real strong smallmouth fishery. But in the process of doing that, Ange and I found that there was over 20 lakes on Vancouver Island that had smallmouth bass in it or, and or largemouth, too. So there's 20, like 23 lakes on Vancouver Island that are just chock full of smallmouth and some largemouth, and they get – you know they got the growing season there, so they're going to get big there. They're getting bigger and bigger all the time. So very and cool. Was, and it's funny because I remember it, we thought it was new, but then then I remember back to one of the very first, in fact, the very first episode we shot in British Columbia, which would have been in 1986 or 87, 86, I think. Uh, we were out there steelhead fishing, and and we had heard about bass on the island, Vancouver Island, but. We couldn't even find out, you know, a name of a lake or anything else. And we had a couple of days after we finished the steelhead show. And uh, and so we went exploring and we did find a lake that had some smallmouth. Uh, but we kind of, I kind of forgot about it, to be honest with you. And then, well, 10 years later, we started getting word that, uh, boy, bastard all out on the West Coast and off we went. So it was a great hot spot if you're from that area. Uh, by all means, check it out. It's on uh, hotspotsoffishingcanada.com. And along with a multitude of other hotspots. Oh, tons. Of, we have so many up there now. Uh, all GPS locations and a few little tips and tricks to uh, to go along with that hotspot. So. Also, a big, uh, what else you got, kid? A big shout out to Lucas Cairn Cross, our youngest Fish in Canada uh, YouTubist, to join us. Uh, he, um, I believe he's yeah. already he's 12 years old. And he's got about six YouTube postings already on fishingcanada.com. You got to see this kid to believe him. This, I, 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 it's a good thing I'm too old to worry about it now because I'll be long gone. But pretty soon he's going to be the big thing on uh, Canadian uh, uh, fishing shows. I'll guarantee you. Don't forget that name. Is uh, it's Lucas uh, Karen Cross. I wonder if I can trade one of my kids for Lucas. <laughs> I might, might have to do a two for one, buddy. Yeah, no problem. Done. I'm done by the weekend. Uh, <laughs> the uh, recent outing that you uh, had, you, you captured that uh, beautiful uh, footage. Oh, the live scope stuff. Yeah, there's another thing on Fishing Canada. We just posted this yesterday on fishcanada.com, folks. Now, you hear Ange and I raving about Panoptics live scope by Garmin, by Garmin. There, that, that, that's a little triangle. Um, well, now with this. Could you be any more discreet, by the way, Peter? It's catching on. Um, so they, uh, yeah, we started to do that little POV stuff. So I was wearing a chest cam, and inadvertently, that chest cam is looking right down at the fish finder. And as I'm watching, I'm, and we're still learning. I say that in that little blog on the website, is that Angie and I, we don't get in a boat and say, there's the live scope. Okay, let's go catch them. 
we learn too, people. We have to sit there and learn and learn. It'd be nice to do it, eh, Anne? But we, but it doesn't happen that way. So, and and I'm still in the learning learning process myself with this. Um, but it's great because now I'm, I'm I'm starting to catch on with a few little tricks and tips. And then in, uh, in the in the process, the bonus to the viewers is they get to see these actual fish. So there's two small mo bass that come cruising in on the screen at different times and moving down towards my bait. I work my bait, work my bait, boom, I catch a smallmouth, release the fish. And then uh, after that, I see another fish moving on the screen. And this is the weird part about live scope. You don't know, always know what it is. And boom, I catch a muskie right after that too, but they're all live scope fish. So it's, uh, I mean, it's it's pretty cool footage. You should check it out, fishingcanada.com, uh, my latest uh, piece on there. So. By the way, just uh, for those of you just joining us, I see some people complaining, saying I'm a little fuzzy. Well, I'm always a little fuzzy anyways at the best of times, but uh, my uh, my laptop just completely blew up about three minutes before we went live today. So I'm on uh, I'm on an old uh, uh, Pine Post laptop that we use in the production uh, part of the company. And yes, it's a little fuzzy. I'm probably, you know, for something as opposed to my beautiful HD image of me. I kind, of, I kind of like this one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, a little fuzzy. Oh, we got somebody from uh, Okanagan Falls. Wow, that's out in the BC, isn't it? I'm yeah, assuming. Yeah, uh, John uh, Tevnot from no Okanagan oh, Falls. Beautiful. Great bass fishing in that whole Okanagan Valley. Oh, this another place. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. There's a Canadian oh. desert, by the way. Anybody's wondering. There is a desert in Canada, and that's right there in the Okanagan Valley there. So, all right. I also want to now talk about something new on Fish in Canada that we haven't talked about here, uh, although it seems like we've got about five or six new things this week. But there is a button now on fishingcanada.com. And I just wonder how many folks have actually noticed us sneaking that in there, I think two days ago on the ribbon at the top of fishingcanada.com. We snuck something in called uh, a Fishing East or Fish East, I guess it is. Fish East, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, we thought we'd sneak that in there, and it, it is a wonderful, wonderful little trip that you're going to make. For all of those of you who have used it and, and have been on it already, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there's a great bunch of guys and girls uh, on the east coast of Canada that are putting out some incredible fishing stories and videos. And so we thought we'd, we'd hook up with them and allow our uh, Fishing Canada people to just naturally gravitate over to them and, and vice versa, back and forth. So uh, I want to welcome all of the contributors from uh, Fish East. And uh, that's a great lead in to our guest today because he is the orchestrator of Fish East. But more importantly, a lot of you know him, certainly um, Pete and I, uh, we know him from uh, about oh, 2010, so about 10 years ago. He was a regular on Fish in Canada television, he uh, uh, was part of a little piece that was sponsored by Castro, and so he was on every week on the show, and uh, we got to know him there, and then he started up this crazy thing that it absolutely exploded in the fishing industry called B1. When we first saw it, what in the world is this going on here, this B1 stuff? Well, little did we know that in a matter of a year or two, it was going to become Wow, I was going to say arguably, but I don't think there's any argument involved. It was the biggest tournament uh, brand in this country. So, uh, but since then, there's been a lot to talk about, and he'll explain a lot of it himself. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the program our good friend. His name is Ben Wu. Where are you, my anglers? And I mean all anglers are always on the prowl to discover the next secret tip or trick that will give them the edge over fish. The latest trend comes from die-hard trout experts who target arguably the most finicky of all species, have now resorted to adding hard plastic beads to their arsenal. You heard me right, beads. The truth of the matter is that a small, bright-colored bead looks strikingly similar to a trout or salmon egg. It flows well in current and can be rigged in a manner that hookups are almost guaranteed. Simply position the bead slightly ahead of the hook and cinch or peg it in place with a toothpick. The next time Mr. Steelhead encounters this hot new presentation, hold on tight because that drag is going to scream. The fish in Canada. Hey. Yeah, baby. <laughs> you, notice, you notice I wear a hat now because I look at that footage and I, I admire that young man on the screen with the, the spiky hair and has that those flowing locks, which simply aren't there anymore. So the hat has to replace that. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was 2010, my friend. Oh, my goodness. And that was great stuff. 
Wow. This, we knew there was a, a, a an immediate, by the way, just to let everybody know, when we did this Castrol pieces back then, Ben was the spokesperson for Castrol, and we said, we need somebody to, to go on camera and do these things, do these little uh, vignettes, and we gave Ben one of those things, he just Boom, like that. He had it done so well. We thought, wow, this guy can talk on camera. This guy's got some talent. So that's you, got, you, you guys talk too highly of me. I mean, I, everywhere I go, everybody asks me how I got started and, you know, w went from being that kid that loved fishing and wanting to do something about it and learning, you know, the tricks in the trade and how to be professional and how to present yourself from you guys. So if I have never said it on air, I'm going to say it right now. It started with you guys. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Uh, all right, we got we got we got a we got a, a ton of stuff to do. We got to cram it all into one tidy little package here. So, so uh, uh, let's let's cut right to the chase. Let's start from from the present. Oh, pardon me, I have an important call coming in. Oh my God! You think by now you would learn to turn that friggin' well, thing off? You're supposed to remind me. You're supposed to remind me about that. Well, I, I had to remind you to get a computer that worked first. Okay, okay. And you <laughs> want to get a laptop that works. You know, I'm not getting the phone. Yeah, great job, boys. I, I feel like I feel like this format really gets the audience to see what happens behind the scenes. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> this is it. This yeah. is it right here. And then somebody. And then somebody. So, um. We first met Ben. Obviously, we just said we were we were. Uh, I won't say we were corralled into taking him on, but uh, but I had you a meeting. Say that. <laughs> I had a meeting with the folks at Castro back in two thousand and eight or two thousand and nine, and we were presenting this uh, segment called the Cutting Edge to them, and they they loved it. They said that would be great, um, but you know, we think we might have the perfect host for that. And I'm thinking, what are we chop liver or something? Oh God. So, no, 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 no. You know, we've got this this uh, young kid that that's up and coming and and uh, taking the industry by storm. And and uh, you know, we'd really let's put it this way: we'd really appreciate it if you would put him on the show. That was the bottom line. And of course, I said, "Well, of course we will," not mm -hmm. knowing what I was agreeing to. By the way, <laughs> and, uh, we were so pleasantly surprised. And that relationship lasted uh, until 2012. Yeah. And then Castro went away, and uh, and unfortunately we couldn't uh, keep you on because you had started something, or you would the, at least the process was in place. You had started something that would eventually uh, absolutely overwhelm the Canadian uh, uh, tournament uh, circuit in uh, in this part of the world, and of course that was the B1. And uh, we watched you from afar when you first started, thinking, hmm. Well, you know what? If anybody's going to pull this off, it's going to be Ben. And my God, did you ever pull it off? Tell us about those early days of B1. First of all, why did you even go down that road? Um, well, as you can remember, you know, uh, my, my, my regular job, like everybody has a regular job. Well, I had a regular job, but that happened to be an event production and sponsorship management. You know, I was heavy in the automotive side and hence the connection with Castrol Oil. And, you know, what I... I started fishing tournaments just at, like anybody else. Hooked up with a friend. I didn't have a boat, so fished the back of the boat. Got involved with some tournaments, and then really got hooked with them. You know, I started looking at the videos online. And back then, you know, YouTube wasn't quite what it is today. So, you know, actual footage and, and content was kind of hard to come by. I mean, I still remember having to go to the new, you know, Plattsburgh in New York to go to the Walmart to pick up like FLW and Bassmaster magazines, right? Because they weren't available here at the time. <laughs> and the only images that I had fed to me growing up was. I hate to bring this up, Pete, but you and the big trucker had in the Mohawk with you know Rocky Crawford and you know what I mean. The, yeah, the big, the big, the big Jim McLaughlins, the Bob Azumis, the once in a while. And me, I didn't live in Ontario; I lived in Montreal. So feeling that type of media uh, was was hard to come by, to say the best at the time. Yeah. So what did I do? I decided to take a vacation and I went down to the Bassmaster Classic. That year it was down in uh, North Carolina or South Carolina. It was on Lake Hartwell. And I happened to have a buddy that was working at ESPN at the time who hooked me up with this sweet, you know, media backstage pass. So I went down there by myself, didn't know anybody. And all I wanted to do was just understand to what level it could be brought, you know, go to the pinnacle, go to the top and then work, you know, and then work, reverse engineered from there. Obviously, needs to say I was blown away, you know, meeting all the guys that, you know, the guys I see on TV and then meeting the production team behind it. It kind of came to me that, you know, something like this at a smaller, more local, regional level could be possible. I think it was just a question of timing and having the right um, tools and, and, and promotion and resources in place to kind of pull off and see if there would be an appetite for something a little bit higher level. You know, Ontario ruled the Canadian bass fishing scene. I mean, I remember the Chevy series, the Mercury series, right? 
Uh, those were the big shows, no question in my mind. In our part of the world, in Quebec, we had small derbies, you know, and that, that's that's what we had locally. So I said, hey, you know, we have some phenomenal bodies of water. And, and it's funny enough, the first year we chose Lake St. Louis, which I know Mon is uh, kind of partial to, right? Um, in Montreal, just in, in, in downtown. And the purpose of that was just to find a body of water that uh, was accessible, I think was the key word, uh, that people felt comfortable with, but also at the same time, big enough to host a big event and maybe, just maybe, draw from outside the immediate region, maybe attract some of the guys from Ontario. Um, we had to dig deep. You know, we didn't have a whole lot of sponsors. We didn't have a whole lot of resources. Uh, like any starting business, you're going to stumble and, and this and that. But what we did manage to pull off was an interesting format. And that was a format that brought anglers together further than just their immediate reach. We had guys from Ottawa. We had guys from Kingston. We had guys from Toronto. We had guys from Quebec City. We had, you know what I mean? A couple guys from the northern U.S. That had never happened. I remember Pete telling me one time he did a Bassmaster event in Lake St. Peter in Montreal and won a boat, a ranger boat in my backyard. I've never even heard of that event. That you know, Not to age you, Pete. That might have been a little bit before my time. But that event there is probably the only high-profile pro event that had ever happened you know, in that region right. um, up until we did something. So call it, you know, young enthusiasm, eagerness to try to do something different, make a name for myself, whatever it may be. You know, I was only in my late twenties then, sure. You know, a lot of spunk, a lot of energy, a lot of ideas and rolled the dice. So said, worst case happens, we have a decent, you know, derby and, and we'll call it that. Well, guys came out, man, like guys came out and the prize was big and we, we, we did it up big. And, you know, what we realized is what um, people were hungry for was the show. Was, was a sense of accomplishment, something they can go home to their peers, their family, and be proud of and say, oh, look at this. This is what we won. And that was the whole premise behind being the one. So yeah. we, we made a big splash with it. We, we played the media, uh, the promotion. You know, Facebook was just starting up at the time. Uh, we definitely rode that train, you know. Yeah. It's hard. As you know, it is hard to get Facebook likes today. And anybody watching should understand that. You guys have done a phenomenal job, not to toot your horn, but you got a lot of Facebook likes. You know, the B1 wow. has over 10,000 likes for a Canadian tournament. I mean, that's that's phenomenal, really. Yeah. But somebody that we should not forget during this whole process, he's, he happens to be on with us right now. Uh, his name is Chris Hockley, who at oh, the time was involved with, uh, with Berkeley, who yeah. made the whole thing possible. I mean, the whole thing, you know, it was to me, it was the perfect storm. Everything was, yeah. was staying on. You know, Chris Hockley happened to get that great job with Berkeley. Oh, I was just going to get to that next. I mean, oh, we needed right. a sponsor, right? Right. I, I, uh, and that was a cold call. Honestly, I was in sales. You guys have done sales. That was a cold call. Like, uh, hello, may I speak with somebody? I'm looking at doing an event that's never happened before. Wondering if you'd be interested. Literally started like that. And just so happened, it was the right guy at the right time, Chris Hockley. Thank you very much if I haven't already told you, but you should already know. Um, got us our start. And having that brand behind us to get going, you know, certainly went a long way. That was great. Right. That was huge when Berkeley hooked up. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I made a big turning point right there. So, so, so let's let's move forward here because we could spend three hours just on the <laughs> series itself. Probably. Okay, but I want to move forward. I want to bring folks that we're not familiar with it right up to date. So, what happened over the next few years? Uh, ben went from this upstart uh, tournament organizer to running the biggest, most uh, professional, well-designed, uh, great execution. Uh, all the main competitors in the country uh, came out to join him. In fact, he drew Peter and I out of retirement. That's how mm -hmm. big this thing was. We had we had yeah. retired from tournament fishing for 15 years, and then this thing came on the scene, and we said, what? We're going to sit on the sidelines? So we, we came out just to fish that tournament, which was, uh, to me, the, I'll never forget the very first one. Um, I was in awe. And I say that not just as a competitor, but you may or may not know this. Uh, we were involved in running the very first Canadian organized pro bass tournaments, period. And that was under the pro bass banner. And that was uh, the Azumis and, mm -hmm. and the Violas and Pete Polkluck and Andy Clements and, and Rocky Crawford. There was a bunch of us got together and said, let's do our own deal. And that was the start of pro bass in this country. And we ran it for, I think, I don't know, five to six years. And then handed it off, and it became a nonprofit to a corporation, and the rest was history. But so, so I was looking at it from a totally different perspective than most of the anglers who competed there. I was looking at it as a business, and I'm thinking, 
wow, this is really, really cool what, what Ben's done here. Because it brought all of the elements together that we have been clamoring for as uh, uh, tournament anglers. And you brought it up under this wonderful brand. And I think the brand was probably one of the most important things uh, was establishing that B1. It became synonymous with quality. It became synonymous with the elite championship in this country. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And it, that's what it was. That's what B1 meant. And, it, and, and to, to win the B1 was you could win any other tournament in the country, but you win the B1 and you've made it. Right? It meant something. It, it, meant, it something. meant something. And, yeah. and you did that in such a short period of time by putting together that package. And, and that, that was wonderful. Moving ahead, um, we have to, because it is the elephant in the room, we have to talk about uh, what happened last year. Yeah. And, so, and I think we would be remiss if we didn't touch on that because one of the things that you were known for and are known for is your extreme care for the fish mm -hmm. and, and the precautions and the painstaking extent that you have gone to make sure that the fish are first and foremost when it comes to, to care. And then you had a disaster. Yep. Tell us about that. So leading up to last year, I would say we were at pretty much the peak of what our plan was. And it changed every year. You know, we did an extra event. We said, how did that go? I remember expanding to Bay of Quinney for the first time. And, you know, there were reservations. It's a different body of water. And with different bodies of water come different scenarios, different challenges. You know, the species was different. It was a predominantly large mouth versus small mouth. Anyways, every, with every new venue, there comes different challenges. And I remember every time we expanded to a new venue, whether it was Lake Erie or, like I said, Bay of Quinney or whatnot, there would always be a set of challenges that came with. And that's what a lot of guys might not you know maybe take a moment to think about you know obviously as anglers as, as tournament anglers you're interested in a few things you're interested where and when you're interested in how much right and who who else is doing it i mean let's as an angler myself though those are things that are important for me because i i have a job i i only have so much budget i want to spend i want to make sure that these things are ticked off so that i maximize you know my time and money which totally makes sense at that time we had expanded to uh that new venue for the first time um, and it was the hot thing, the new venue being St. Lawrence River, you know, and put this in context two years when we're doing planning a year out. You know, Bassmaster had visited there twice now, I think at that point. Um, the FLW had visited as well. It was a hot spot. Everybody wanted to fish it. it, it like it was the deal. Um, St. Francis is great in the fall, but as you know, St. Lawrence River, St. Francis, although it's quote unquote the same water, it really fishes completely different. And I think we all under recognize that. So we saw it as another opportunity to showcase Canadian water. Um, potentially break a record, you know, and, and fish, uh, showcase the fish. I mean, that's what we do. You know what I mean? Um, and you're right. Taking care of the fish, obviously paramount. We would not have lasted 10 years in this business if we didn't take care of the very resource that we're here to fish for, you know? Um, you know, I could sit here and talk about all the great stuff we did, but unfortunately, like anything else, bumps happen in the road, and those are the bumps that you, you need to address, and that's what we're addressing today. Uh, I think if I had to look back on it, um, expanding a little bit too fast, you know, growing pains, needing more resources, more brain power, more team members to do the amount of events that we we're doing. Remember, we went from a singular event in Quebec to three events to nine events. Yeah. It happened pretty quick. And nine events from, the, from Nova Scotia all the way to Western Ontario. That is, you know, we live in a big country. I don't have to tell you guys that. It's, we live in a vast country. The travel alone is logistical, right? Um, so I'm going to mix that with, the, you know, growing pains, um, perhaps being a little naive on how fast we can grow. You know, if I look 2020, hindsight 2020, we are on fire. Everybody's fishing the events. We're getting sponsors. We're giving away amazing prizes. You know, let, let's keep the ball rolling. Well, unfortunately, some things that you learn is sometimes you can't grow too fast, especially when, it, when you're dealing with, with nature and wildlife and animals for that, for that matter, this, in this particular situation, marine life, you know, St. Lawrence river presented a scenario that we had quite frankly, never encountered before. You know, we're talking about that particular year, very low water conditions. If we go back to it, it was very low. In fact, a lot of the marinas were closed because it was so low. Uh, we we were talking about, um, was it, is that year that had the, yes, it was that year that had the super high water, um, in the spring and then dropped incredibly. Yeah. Uh, we're talking really big fish. We're talking about deep fish potentially. Like there's no, there was no precedent to it. There was no data to go on Canadian side 
of, of what that would represent. All we did as an organization was, you know, let's look when, when would be a good time? Well, you know, the fishing season starts ex that date. Let's do it two weeks after the starting, you know, that kind of gives us a bubble. We don't want to be right at the opener, make sure the fish are uh, done spawning and doing all that. And, uh, Let's go give the people and the anglers the event that they want. I mean, that's that's what we're here to do. So a lot of challenges came up. Fish care was definitely one of them. You know, we did our best to do what we always do with the equipment that we always use that has proven successful. You know, uh, many can argue, yeah, but, you know, you, St. Francis isn't the same as Erie, and Erie is not the same as uh, Quinny. And no, it's not. I'm the first one to tell you. It is not. You know, they're totally different environments with to a whole totally different set of challenges. Whether that be fizzing, whether that be water temperature, whether that be oxygen levels—I mean, it's a—it's a whole whole thing. Um, so, and you, depend, and you depend a lot on your anglers too, right? I mean, you're—I'm uh, thinking back to the old days when I was involved in organizing events mm -hmm. like this. You depend a lot on the competitors to kind of catch up with you mm -hmm. and sort of expect them to be on the same level that you are in terms of thinking. You mentioned fizzing, yeah. You know, uh, we've talked about fizzing on this program oh, three or four times now and how important it's, it's becoming uh, uh, to tournament anglers to be able to properly fizz a fish. Well, there is not a fizzing school that you can send your competitors to. It's not like no. you, you know, train them all. So you are, you know, at risk of putting your reputation and your brand on the line based on what your competitors do. I'm not <laughs> suggesting that this is what happened. No, here, no, no. So don't but, get me wrong. But, but it is part and parcel of the potential problems. The fact that you expanded, the fact that you went into waters that you were not familiar with during some pretty difficult conditions um, in terms of, of nature probably added to it, I'm assuming. You know, it, 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 it was the perfect storm. And, mm -hmm. and consequently, the disaster did take place. But it, it, people need to remember, too, the people watching that have never fished a tournament, it is in the angler's best interest to keep their fish as well as they can because they get penalized if they weigh them in dead if they come in dead in the live wells or etc so so the anglers you know they, they do try the the experienced ones will try their best to do you know and they'll see the signs etc cetera, etc cetera. I, I want to be very clear about something and this is very important that i say this b1 anglers and those are fish to b1 i hold them the highest regard when it comes to fish care you will yeah. not find more sportsmen like people than tournament uh, anglers who care about their fish more than anybody else absolutely bar none having said that and specifically with the Gananoque event those fish came in healthy. The anglers did what they had to do to keep them safe. What okay. happened between the time they handed us the fish and us trying to get it back, we're still under investigation. We're trying to figure out what's going on. Obviously, it, the outcome was not what it was, was meant to be for anybody, yeah. certainly not for myself personally, certainly not for the entire team and all the volunteers involved with the B1 brand um, or anybody involved for that matter. I mean, nobody wants to see that happen. That's not why we went to Thunder right. You know, we went there to put on a spectacular event to show sure. off what a, a great fishery it is. So um, and that's David what it is. Kelly, David Kelly's got a good point. You know, we've been beating around the bush here. David uh, Kelly saying, I still don't know what he's talking about in terms of disaster. Oh, let, well, yeah, you don't have to go very far. So we had a significant fish die at that event. Uh, just to put this in context on any top event um, in Canada, uh, you know, you are an, a, a, for to be acceptable as a, as a well-run tournament, you want to run, you know, less than 7% fatality rate, mor mortality rate, um, walking away from any event. Uh, that would be acceptable. You know, um, this was way beyond that. We were probably in the in the 25 to 30% range. Wow. So it was very high. Um, this and that's is, why we call it a disaster because it, it is was. a disaster. That's all it is. That's all it can be called. It is a, it is a disaster. There's no yeah, question about it. Again, that's more fish. Just to put this in context. We lost more fish at that one event than we had in the last three seasons combined. Yeah. I mean, we've done three events since that point, which we had less than 1%. Yeah. With the same equipment, the same standards, the same pro you know protocol. And we can talk about that. But at the end of the day, this was an exception that was beyond any, you know, predetermined uh, expectation. And, if it, and people are wondering, too, I, I've shared the bowl with Ben Wu. Um, a few times. Ben and I have fished together uh, more than a few times, and he has the highest regard for fish life, for largemouth and smallmouth bass, as, as much as anybody on this earth. He does not, when we're out fishing on that, he treats those fish like his little babies. Okay, I'm going to tell you that right now. So, and there's no way that Ben said, ah, piss on it. We got the fish kill is going to be, is not worth it. We got to make our money here. That's not Ben Wu. That is not going to happen there. So, you know, 
I don't talk about it much because I don't feel I need to, but people have asked, you know, like, is it was, was it just a fish? Does, is it just another digit, right? Like any, or, or yeah. collateral, right? We'll call it collateral. This is not yeah. collateral we're talking about. We're talking about a natural resource that's shared by all. You're yeah. talking about someone like myself who spends time doing research studies with the Quebec government for studies on biotrauma on fish. Should we fish? Should we not fish? We're I just finished a tagging study with largemouth bass in the St. John River with the Canadian Rivers Institute. We're doing, um, uh, we, 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 we make sure on the East Coast anyhow that we uh, have pressure washers in place to clean off all boats because we don't want to transfer, you know, invasive aquatic um, botanical species like Asian milfoil from what, I mean, it's, it's part and parcel. If you want to make a living, if you want to be somebody in fishing, you have to be responsible. You got to go above and beyond, really. Or else you're just the next guy. Yep. And and everybody on this podcast I know obviously has gone above and beyond. Um, just not what we just see in the surface. So I, I appreciate your comments, Pete. And for anybody to think otherwise, I, I don't see how that would make any sense. Yeah, you're wrong. Trust me on that one. You're wrong, people. If you think it's different, so 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 this happens. Um, it's happening live. You're seeing it happen. Mm -hmm. Competitors are seeing it happen, and it happens very quickly. Yeah, uh, I talked to some of the uh, competitors. They're saying it was a matter of minutes that that their fish were alive, and then they weren't. You know, and, yeah. and so it happened quickly. What was going through your head, man? Like well, you got to you got to be able to. I, I know that's probably a difficult question, but at that moment, uh, I could say I was freaking out. What else would anybody do? Yeah. You freak out like you're you're seeing something happen that is totally unprecedented, oh. unplanned for, and something you've never seen before. And you obviously know there's something not right. Yeah, you know, uh, and it happens quickly. And they're right, absolutely happen quickly. We've streamlined that process to like 45 seconds in angler. Why? Because we want to get anglers back the fish back in the water as quickly as possible. Yeah. So you know, you take a look at that entire way, and it only took 45 minutes. So yeah, absolutely, I agree. It took it. It happened really quick. But at the same time that it happens quick, you only have so much time that you could react. Right. You know, when st it, it's kind of like this, you know, when when things happen and you're dealing with with wildlife like this, there's unless uh, the, unless the answer is crystal clear, it's very tough to, you know, make the proper adjustment on the fly to change a situation. Well, um, in, in order for you to do that, you'd have to know what the problem was. And, 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 there, and, there, therein lies the problem. You know what I mean? Like, and, and this is happening live. And, mm -hmm. and so, and so, never mind trying to fix it. You, you, you got to figure out what's going on live while you're putting on an event. And I, it's, it's, it's. James, James Hand. I was just about to say something, and now James brought it up. So I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say this. We had heard somebody had brought up. Is it a possibility? That it was sabotage. That somebody did not like the B1 organization. That somebody didn't like Ben Wood. That somebody dropped so much of the tank there and just accidentally dropped a little piece of something in there. Is that a possibility, Ben, at all? I operate, as you know me, with trust for everybody. Yeah. Everything we do is open. We don't hide anything behind curtains. We don't do anything behind, you know, screen or window. Everything is right there. Yeah. So if you're asking me if there's access to any of the, the, the process or the, the tanks, of course there is. We, we make it a point to be accessible. So if people have questions, they want to know what we're doing, you know, why are there bubblers? Why are there oxygen panels? What is this chemical that you're putting in there? It's all right there. So yeah. is it accessible? Absolutely. That I'll say. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you uh, know about the I, sabotage thing. I don't know. I'm I don't not, have a comment to that, but I can tell you it is accessible. I'm not nearly as virtuous as you are, as you know. So I will tell you right now, the people that Peter is referring to that came out immediately and, and signal sabotage, one of them was me, as you know, because mm -hmm. there was no other way, in my opinion. And I don't, I don't want to get into this because I know this whole thing is still under investigation, but I wouldn't feel right if I didn't put my two cents in. And sometimes that gets me in trouble. I understand. But that's fine. That's cool. I said it right from the onset, the minute that I heard that this was happening, that there was some tampering, because even if you had total disregard for these fish. Even if keeping those fish alive was the least important thing to you, and we know those two things did not happen because I know you personally, and it couldn't happen. But let's just say that it did happen. Even if you wanted to, Ben, you couldn't have made that happen like that unless, unless you intervened with nature. And so that's why I say that this was an intervention by an outside party I'll, I'll leave you with two things to think about, okay? And I'm, I'm being virtuous. 
Uh, number one, on day two, after knowing what happened on day one, you know, the first thing I want to say is now thinking back, I probably should have canceled the event. You know, seeing that what has happened, I think I should have canceled the event. Sitting with the team, analyzing what has happened, we figured the, you know, the only variable we could have thought of was maybe the tanks were not clean and we should change all the water from the, you know, from everything we had on day one and use fresh water for day two, scrub it all down, disinfect it. You know, there must have been, we must, something must have slipped. That's the only thing we could think of. So together with team, we said, listen, it's got to be something there. We'll clean it all up. Everything should go fine on day two. Well, guess what? The same result happened in day two after we changed all those variables. So that's the first thing I want to say. The next thing I want to say is I would like to know if anybody could reverse engineer and make me cut and, and have that result given those parameters and tell me how I was, how anything, how that could even happen. If yeah. I told you the challenge was you have this much time, you have this much fish, you know, um, this is the end result that I need. How do you do it? I'd, I'd like someone to sh shed some light on that because I'm baffled. I, honestly, I'm, yeah. you no, know, I think, I think I'm, I'm humble enough at this point to tell you, yeah, we made mistakes and do we regret some of them? Absolutely. If we can make them better, we could. But there are certain things that I am just baffled over. Bottom line, before we move on, I just want to say that uh, it did turn out to be the biggest disaster in, in tournament fishing in this country. Uh, hell, maybe in North America, for all I know, as far as documented events. But but certainly in this country, certainly in this part of the world, there's never been a bigger disaster in tournament fishing. That's the negative. On the positive side is what it did do is, regardless of how it happened, and we'll, we'll hopefully find out one day, because it is an ongoing investigation, so hopefully, hopefully it will come out. But anyways, even if we don't, the positive side is that it's opened a lot of eyes. And in fact, a lot of uh, your uh, counterparts and yourself have started looking into different ways of holding tournaments where maybe we don't roll the dice because this is a roll of the dice. Maybe we don't roll the dice with Mother Nature anymore. Maybe we don't need to house 400, 500 fish on land in order to pull off a tournament. And, and it's given you uh, and the other organizers an opportunity to sit back a little bit and say, what can we do better? And I know you're working on a bunch of new stuff, but maybe you could just share with us some of the ideas yeah. that would have come up. You know, I got to give credit where credit's due. So many people did reach out to us with different ideas and, hey, did you consider this or maybe you should try this? Um, one of the train of thoughts that really stuck with us was the, the kayak tournament fishing community. They reached out to us and said, have, you know, have you considered not transporting fish, regardless of what time of the season, and, and, and going to a catch photo release I thought you were going to say. To, I thought you you were going to say we have to fish from kayaks. No, no, no. But but what what kayak tournaments have really done no, well? Not big. Sorry, Ben. The problem yeah. is Viola would have a two hundred horsepower on his freaking kayak. Okay. Yeah, he would. He definitely absolutely yeah. would with like four ten inch screens somehow mounted. <laughs> but um, the the concept of catching a fish, measuring it, taking a photo, and re immediately releasing it. I mean that. That right there, I, I understand, and a lot of guys are saying, oh, the length is not the same as the weight. Yes, I agree to all those things. But if you take a second and back out of the forest, that eliminates so many things. It eliminates fish care. It eliminates fizzing. It eliminates potentially taking fish off of spawning grounds. It el eliminates moving fish from one section of the body of water to another in a habitat that they may not be comfortable with. Example, going into the back bay, catching a largemouth, and bringing them all across this big, deep, rocky area with current into smallmouth territory. It's endless. Um, it eliminates even having a live well on board. Anybody with a boat could participate, so accessibility. There's a lot of thought to be given there. In fact, we, we, we took it so seriously, we actually in, um, um, posted that we would do an event in Fredericton based completely on catch photo release. If anybody wants more information on it, Tourney X is the application that's developed. It's been around for about six, seven years. It's out of the US. Um, they developed it for kayak. And now, as you know, Bassmaster as well as FLW have now adopted professional kayak bass tournaments. And guess what application they use? Tourney X. Yeah. Based on based on the phone, GPS, you know, tracking. There's so many things in place to make sure no foul plays at hand um, potentially could be something you know that could grow in the future i know there's going to be traditionalists again i'm going to go back to that main point because that's what i hear a lot you know it's it's length it's not weight weight is what we want at what cost is the question yeah at what cost yeah so, good point. food for thought that's all i'm saying food for thought and, um, you know, 
same rules apply for everybody. So if somebody thinks that they'd be getting penalized because they're not able to use weight factor, it's the same for everybody. Everybody mm -hmm. can say the same, right? So, so I, I, I don't think that's uh, an issue. The issue, though, is this. We would need to completely come out of that mindset that we need that hero shot on stage with a handful of big fish. That's really the bottom line here. Yeah. Right? We need to yeah. eliminate that completely from the vocabulary of tournament fishing. It doesn't exist anymore. Well, the, the way they would do it is you would submit you know, all your catches, and it's a live leaderboard. You know what everybody else is catching at the same time, so you know what position you're in, and they cut off that leaderboard about two hours before the end just to save some suspense. Yeah. And then when you know you have a big fish, you can submit a, a, a hero photo. And when you come to the gala or the prize ceremony at the end, they do the top 10, unveil it on the big screens, like kind of like a PowerPoint presentation. And, right. and the drama is all there because nobody really knows what the final score is. So, yes, you're right. It eliminates holding the fish, right? That's what everybody wants, that money shot, that Facebook profile. Um, but it doesn't eliminate the giant check. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, that's all I'm saying. You're you know? right. You're right. And I, and just that we can end on this. People think that Ben's not running any tournaments because of all this bad negativity. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's because of this COVID going on right now that you can't have any events. Well, we had plans to put on our – we had, what, five events in the East Coast, one in Quebec, and two in Ontario, all ready to go. Uh, we did obviously learn from, you know, what happened. We streamlined some processes that we started implementing late last season. Um, and, and one of them was getting the anglers involved and helping us. You know, we have limited resources too. A lot of people think we're this giant corporation that can have, you know, unlimited amount of staff to do whatever we need to. No, we're like four or five people that put this together, volunteer based. That's something that people didn't understand. So, you know, yeah, we leaned on the anglers to help us out. And we did so in, in, in a, an event in Fredericton last year, as well as with Valley Field. And I'll tell you what, it was fantastic. You know, it was teamwork. The fish were out of the water for the, the least amount of time in all 10 years that we've been doing it. Um, and our, our the, the survival rates were incredible. And it was just so easy. Less logistics. Oh, for sure. And getting back to the lack of drama at the end with the live audience and fish and stuff, yeah. we anticipated that, in fact, the NFL, the NHL, and all the other professional sports leagues are doing exactly that now with this COVID. So it wouldn't have really altered anything no no Unfor right? unfortunately we're in a situation you know because we do events in multiple different provinces every province has a different set of right. rules and every region has a different set of rules uh, as an organization you know w our first challenge is a the fact that we're so vast and uh, as far as multi-province you know i happen to live in new brunswick for me to go to montreal to do an event i have to personally you know right now as it stands quarantine myself for 14 days. I can't even work if I got when I come home. Wow. So that's a challenge in itself. I mean, let's just start from the personal side. And then and then the volunteers. Exactly. I mean, we're these are people that are giving their own free time to come put on events for other people at that risk. I can't ask that of people. Nobody can. And you know, I mean, it's it's a lot to ask. Mm -hmm. Um and everything else. I mean, sponsors, you know, everything else I mean, it's just it's it, it I want to use an expletive here, but I'm not sure if I can. But it, Feel free. it's a crap show this year. Let's put it that way. It's an absolute you can crap say show. shit, Ben, from something like that. You can say it's, right. a shit. it's a shit show. And anybody who wants to argue <laughs> me on that, I'll take it on. No problem. It is an absolute shit show. Nobody expected it. You know, this was the year we really want to come back and show people, hey, yeah, we stumbled. Yeah, we made some mistakes. We, yeah. You know, we let some of our fans and some of our customers down. But we want to have that chance to kind of redeem ourselves and show, you know what? We do learn. We can progress. We can move forward. And that opportunity was taken away from us, which really pisses me off and pisses a yeah. lot of our, everybody involved off because we didn't get yeah. that chance. Uh, I think the best way to sum up this part of our uh, of our piece is uh, uh, Yvonne says, stay positive, guys. It's the key. So we're going to we're going to use uh, Yvonne. Thank you, Yvonne. For you, yeah, absolutely, and we'll Although, get through. tons of positivity. I hope yeah, we get to that next. So let's talk about what what all of this led to, yeah. um, including. Uh, an it, did I hear correctly? Now I, I've been known to make a mistake or two on this. No, yeah, 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 yeah. Once in a while, I will. Did I hear that you're you're now uh, uh, something akin to Green Acres with oh, Mr. Gosh. Mr. Douglas <laughs> and. Uh, and family, like I don't know. I don't know if akin would be the right word, but uh, okay. So on a personal note, on a personal note, I had an opportunity to move out east, and we've 
always talk about the East Coast. I think there's no secret we all love the East Coast. You guys have come out there many times. And I've always been a big, you know, when we expanded our B1 to the East Coast, it gave me the opportunity to visit often, meet new people, make new friends. Um, push came to shove, and I had this incredible opportunity personally uh, for a job. Um, I was to be a marketing manager for Volvo cars in the East coast, but that meant moving to Fredericton. Um, that was a great opportunity for me career wise. And, you know, it just gave me an excuse to go to the wife and say, Hey, I think we should move out East. And she came along and we found this incredible, you know, property out here and it, it just made sense. So we made the move. Um, again, being the shit show that this year is, I got laid off in March as many other fellow Canadians have, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it is what it is. There's not much more to, to talk about. You know, that's just something that happened. And sometimes life just throws you curveballs like that. And lemons. And what do you do with lemons? You make lemonade. That's what I was taught. Squeeze them, buddy. Squeeze them. Squeeze them. Squeeze them hard, right? So yeah. um, what you what Angela was referring to is our property. We've, uh, it, you know, with COVID-19 being home, homeschooling my children from home, spending time at home, we've, we've kind of started a homestead business, um, pr basically focusing on uh, different types of chickens, chicks. Uh, eggs. Uh, we do quail, so wild Coturnix quail and eggs as well. And we have ponds and we uh, we have uh, brook trout all stocked up in one on natural feed as well. And I'm on the, in the process of working out a license to get Arctic char in the other one. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So Very cool. That's, that, what we're, that's what I've been up to. That means Pete and I would never have to travel and we could shoot the whole Fish in Canada series. You, you literally can. I have a whole set up, set up waiting for you guys. You got all the parking. Got a space for yourself, ready and to go. You can to eat them too. Oh, <laughs> heavens, yes. You know, we, we we tried one the other day just to see, you know, the, just to, you know, we take the data to see how they're growing. Um, yeah. And they're eating a healthy amount of insects, a little bit of minnow, and some of the pellet feed. I mean, the meat is nice and pink and red, mm -hmm. almost like a wild, you know. Nice. And they've grown pretty much an inch to an inch and a quarter per month. Holy man. So I put them in at four, and they're they're clo they're pushing on 12 inches now. Nice. Yeah. And they taste pretty good. Oh, yeah. I would challenge you if you would taste the difference. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. All so, right. So I didn't bring you on because of your pretty face. Didn't yeah. bring you on because of the, you know, the past. I'm bringing you on here because I understand that you've got something that you would like to break live on. Yes. The yes. Webcast, and I need to have it now. Okay. Here it is. So I, the cast on the bag, obviously I'm living in the East coast. Take two steps back for the last three, four years. I've been a part of a television show in French in Quebec called Le Juste, probably still going as one of the best or most watched television shows in Quebec. What I loved about that experience was the type of show that it was, and very much like Fish in Canada, it was a, a multi-species format type of show. And what I what what I gained from that is the satisfaction of exploring new species, exploring new regions. And when I came to the East Coast, the first thing I realized is, man, what a resource this place has. Yeah. So quickly started YouTubing and trying to find more information. Just as an angler, like, hey, where can I, you know, wet a, wet a, a line? Where can I go, you know, do some bushwhacking? Where can I put a boat in? All that stuff. And there had there wasn't a lot to 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 learn from. There wasn't a whole lot of resources. Started digging a little bit deeper, and I realized quickly that wow, this incredible region, who has amazing resources when it comes to sport fishing needed a voice needed a platform needed something to for for anglers that could share information passion tips tricks whatever you want to call it and that and and, and the idea of fish east came along and, and fish east what it is it is a brand that represents the collective and the lifestyle of multi-species angling in the east coast and i say multi-species because not only are we dealing with freshwater we're also dealing with salt water I mean, salt water to the point where, yeah, jigging for squid is a thing here. You know, like guys, guys on Lake Simcoe are like jigging for what? They're not perch. No, squid, actual squid. Um, but you know, tuna. We got tuna. We've got flounder. We've got stripers. We've got mackerel. We've got haddock. We've got. I mean, there's just so much stuff. Um, and of course, you know, everybody in Central Canada and Western Canada, when you think of East Coast, what do you think of? You think of salmon. I mean, that's kind of trout and salmon. Yes, don't get me wrong. There are some incredible salmon opportunities. You guys know that too. But what about the 95 other percent that are out there um, that, that may be a little bit more accessible? And, and, and like being accessible and access, that really is the theme. So if you go to fishies.com, it is a collective. That's the best way I could put it. Collective of passionate anglers throughout the East Coast, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, PEI, New Brunswick, sharing stories, sharing videos, sharing articles, blogs, 
And uh, again, thank you so much for Fishing Canada to include us in your in your content. We were well, the team, the contributors are super enthusiastic to be able to share their passion on a, a much wider scale through Fishing Canada. And if we could be that voice or or, or source for that, that'd be amazing. Um, so on this journey of building this multi-species kind of platform network, uh, we were approached by uh, tourism locally. So hey, uh, basically COVID-19 has screwed up all our plans. Uh, we need people moving around the province and regionally. We they, their their whole focus is staycation, you know. Get you know yes, still take a vacation with your family, but explore your own province. No, we can't go to Ontario. No, we can't go to Quebec. But let's learn about our own province. Can you guys fish east? Help us create some videos and stuff for awareness. To tell people what's available over here. And uh, that's what we're going to do. So the big announcement, I'm going to let you guys ask some questions. I know I talk a lot. The big announcement is we are launching a brand new television series focused completely on East Coast fishing. Again, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PI, Newfoundland, um, that starts airing January of 2021 on Wild TV. It marks the first national program on television that's based on the East Coast. The only other guys that really have showed us love is you guys. You guys come out, you know, to the East Coast and shoot the stripers or shoot whatever you do. Um, but here's our chance to speak from a local perspective to a, to a national audience. And that is huge news. And I'm, I can't be more proud of us. You know, I'm a small player within the whole thing. Yeah, I came up with the name and I helped, you know, position it and, and help produce it. But it, without the, 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 the content providers and the contributors, Fish East would not be where it is. Here you go again. By, yes, by golly, all oh, shucks. Come on, I didn't do anything. I love it. I love that about you, man. <laughs> you're were, you were a contributor, all right. I'd say yeah. Ben's pretty instrumental in a lot of this stuff going on, too. Well, I, listen. You know, it's, I, uh, but all in a good way, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just so amazing when, when people are given the opportunity, how passionate. They, I mean, I'll just give you a snippet. You know, we, we shot a, a show in St. John last week. St. John is not terribly known for fishing. Like, you know, it's not really even on your hotspot, man. Maybe it should be because I'll tell you why. Um, we're showcasing everything from shore fishing to kayak to, you know, um, it, it could be a canoe. It could be a powerboat, all different types of opportunities. And we were in Rockwood Park, which is literally like a central park for St. John. This thing has like nine lakes and brook trout, what, like right there in downtown from shore. Yeah, really? That's incredible. What I was going to say, Ben, I mean, aside, by the way, congratulations. I think that's fantastic news. And, and thank you for sharing that here and breaking it on Fish in Canada, by the way. I appreciate that. But but what, 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 what I, I think what's exciting about this is probably what most people are, are missing here. One of the problems with the East Coast, uh, you mentioned we've been down there several times. I think that's an understatement. We, we make a point of being down there every year. Mm -hmm. We make a point of trying new species down there every year. One of the problems that we've encountered is that the local, the hardcore local anglers, the old timers, not not the mainstream angler, but the old timers, refuse to accept the fact that there's anything else down there no. worth <laughs> worth keeping other than salmon. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. and so every time we go down to fish bass or muskie or anything else, there's a certain amount of resistance locally. I think I think Fish East could change all of that, not because it's going to promote this to the rest of the country and the rest of the world, but I think the real values of Fish East are going to happen internally in the East oh, Coast, you, right? Man, do you understand the market? I mean, you well, nailed that on the head. I can't, you know, I posted a picture of me with two jumbo perch. Now, we know, we love fishing for perch, especially keeping them in the fish fry and the whole, that, that doesn't exist down there. No. They don't look at perch the same way. Uh, white perch, they don't look at it the same way. And it's, uh, but here's the thing, here's the thing, and I don't want to be negative about it. I think what fishy, and you're right, you know, if anything at all we accomplish is that we get to influence some new anglers, maybe some younger anglers to say, hey, there are some awesome opportunities out there. Yeah, your granddad taught you to only, you know, chase Atlantic salmon, and it's okay if you catch one in five years. It's fine. That's how it is. Or we can go slam 300 chain pickerel this afternoon. Good point. Make a choice. You know what I mean? Like that's that's kind of the deal. Ben so, and I, had, Ben and I had a chat on the phone this week, a couple of days ago, and he was telling me about his perch fishing and about a yellow perch and white perch, and 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 how uh, we take it for granted in Ontario for sure, and I'm sure Quebec and probably any province that normally has perch is that that's like the the delicacy of all fish. When you're going to eat, you're going to get a feed a feed of perch. You're not going to get a catch of perch. You're going to get a feed of perch. Ben said he doesn't know anybody that he's met so far out there 
that would even think about fishing for them, let alone eating them. He says it is an unheard of thing that out there. They say perch. What what the hell are they? Or why are you fishing for them? It's it's. I mean, you're going to open the eyes up to a lot of people. Hopefully, they'll try. Oh, it. They'll, they'll I, I, we're going to do cook and catch. Like we're going to do yeah. some cook and catch videos for sure. I mean, that's part of the deal, right? You, enjoy harvest once in a while and enjoy it i mean that's what that's what it's all about Absolutely. and and let me tell you guys they're jumbos i mean i have this one lake 20 minutes from my house i don't think i've caught a perch under 13 inches oh, oh my god like the only other place i can think of that has perch like that is simcoe yeah 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 and, and, that's, then, an, and yeah. that's an exceptional jurassic type of environment like it doesn't even make sense but you know what i mean so, so these are not indigenous. I mean, I don't think perch were were oh. stocked. Were they stocked there? Like, how how, do, how does this? I, I do not have like, any why, inkling. Why would they stock the fish that nobody even knows about, though? That's the thing. You know, why you wouldn't stock a fish that nobody knows about? That's true. I mean, the the, the smallmouth were stocked way back when. Yeah. Uh, the muskies came down from the Quebec waterways. Right. Uh, which you know, I mean, we can go all day about weird stuff because like muskies aren't even recognized as a species. I know in New Brunswick. They're yeah. everywhere. I mean, right. every, downtown. For, well, you know, Pete, you look at the giant you caught last time you were here. There's yeah. some big ones down here. Yeah. You know, I just did. And I think Jeff Wilson might, might have broke the story on this. Uh, we just did a tagging program with the Canadian Rivers Institute for largemouth bass in the St. John River. Uh, OK, I know that doesn't mean anything to you guys, but largemouth bass does not exist in the Maritimes. Right. right. Well, right. so right. they thought. So they thought. Right. Right. Um, they trust me, they are there and they like jig and pig. So, I mean, it's pretty fun. <laughs> but again, another species that is not even listed as a sports species, a sporting species, um, by the Department of Natural Resources. So, and the beauty yeah. of uh, something like Ben's doing right now, just to let everybody know, is yeah, Angie and I might not travel all the way to the east coast to go largemouth fishing. But no, what we're doing is they're telling everybody at the east coast, you know what? There's a great species of fish here available to you that's a half an hour down the road called largemouth bass, and you're gonna have a riot fishing them. You're gonna introduce people to it, local people to it, which is fantastic. That's really exactly, exactly what we're doing. I don't know if I agree with you that we might not travel east for largemouth, and, and I when I say we, I mean, I mean, avid anglers i think yeah. i think it is i think it is a possibility well geographically angelo there is no largemouth in quebec past three rivers right that's halfway between montreal and toronto from there until fredericton there is no largemouth and that's a i mean that's a big distance a lot of yeah a lot of land and water yeah 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 but we have no problem traveling all over the place for for largemouth do we oh no, oh, right? no absolutely you will I mean, go to the extent of even uh, fabricating a fictitious vacation for the family in order to participate in bass. Oh, fishing. you don't say. Oh, I might do that. <laughs> I didn't want to do something like that, you know? Okay, uh, Dad, you there's other things I'm super excited about. You know, Lake Ontario, with Lake Ontario, you know, we got that steelhead and brown run, right? Which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, the, the, the steelhead or the rainbow trout and the speckled trout here get to be a, quite a big size. Um, down Cape Breton Way, in the Bredore Lakes, they have sea run speckles which go five, six pounds. Yeah. So I remember seeing that episode you guys shot was at the French River. Mm -hmm. And I was jealous like crazy. It was a French River. Nipigan? So, Nipigan, yeah. Nipigan. And you're casting for these gigantic speckles. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sim similar to that, but they're sea run, but they're, they kind right. of get landlocked within the Bredore Lake. So that's certainly something I am dying to go explore. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, sea run brown, sea run speckles, uh, no. steelhead. You mentioned Bredore. Uh, that's, if I'm not mistaken, isn't that one of the largest freshwater? Uh, it, yes, hundred yeah, percent. It, it's huge. It makes yeah. Lake Champlain look tiny. Right. Uh, yeah. Then, yeah. Absolutely. Tell us about it. Uh, did you say there was steelhead down there? Oh well, rainbow trout. Rainbow trout. Right. Rainbow. Sea run rainbow trout. Right. So is that a steelhead? I don't know. A biologist got it. Yeah, I still yeah. don't know. I still don't know the difference between a steelhead and a rainbow. Yeah, that that is that. And obviously, you've got true steelhead, just like they do on the west coast. Ours right. are, ours are steelhead, but but not really steelhead. Although we call them steelhead. Well, do you really have salmon? Uh, well, we don't. Well, I don't know. That that's <laughs> I don't know. Depending on who you're talking to, right? I guess so. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it sounds fantastic, man. You've got you've got nothing. But Huge opportunities. Have you guys been to Newfoundland yet? Oh yeah. So, so oh, yeah. I haven't done that yet. I am dying to get out there. Oh. Oh my Dying God. To get oh my there. God. You don't think about Newfoundland, I'll tell you, and I've said it on this program and, and, and the TV show and the radio show as well. You know, fishing almost becomes secondary, although it is fantastic. Don't get me wrong. 
once you hit the rock, fishing is is just part and parcel of what mm. you're going to experience because the local culture and flavor of the people of Newfoundland is unsurpassed. It is unparalleled anywhere on this planet. So yeah. fishing, although you go down there to fish, it kind of gets buried about three or four levels. Oh, I hear you. And, and you know, that's something you're going to find true throughout the Maritimes. You know, yes. every Maritime province has its own flavor and it has its own accent, which I'm sure you've noticed as well. Oh. But the, the one thing that is undeniable is the hospitality. Oh, without a doubt. Without I mean, jeez. And I might add for those people that are trying, gonna visit Newfoundland, I've only heard this, okay? But I have kind of experienced it. The women are hot. <laughs> the women are hot. Is, that, is that before or after the screech? That's the, no, no, no. That's pre-screech. That's pre-screech. Pre-screech. Yeah, good-looking women in Newfoundland. Just so that yeah. you know, you know, you know. You know we are now living in a society that is not very tolerant to comments like that, right? You do. Yeah, know. no, I do. There's a great comment I just see come up on the screen. What? If, what? if you fish, what? If you, what? <laughs> you look at women in Newfoundland. I love that's a that's a yeah. compliment. The women are beautiful. They are. The people have said it. The people are beautiful in Newfoundland. Well, okay, hey, bye. It just so happens his flavor are women. I mean, you can't, yeah, you can't judge yeah. the guy for that. <laughs> Um, I just want to, there's a comment that came up. If you fish out of province, you need a guide that law should change. You know what? There, you do need a guide if you want to fish salmon specifically in New Brunswick. Um, honestly, I don't know what that's all about. Uh, okay. I happen to be really good friends with Mike Holland, who's the um, uh, Minister of Natural Resources. And he's been doing a phenomenal job. Like up until this year, we had a list this short of where you can ice fish. Did you hear what I just said? A list this short, there are 500 lakes plus in New Brunswick. There was a list this short of where you were allowed to ice fish. Mike Holland has now expanded that to like a four-page list, which is amazing. Right. Another right. thing he's done, which make rest of Canadians aware, there were two licenses that you needed. You needed a regular season fishing license, and then you had to buy an ice fishing license. I've never heard of that. Have you heard of that? No. It's, a, it's a little bit different. He's merged that. Now you buy one fishing license, you're good for the year. So to answer to answer that gentleman's question, um, I don't know what that's all about. Because in Nova Scotia, you don't need a guide. Okay. On the other side of that, in Newfoundland, you cannot wet a line, period, any without, without a licensed guide. Really? Okay. Well, there you go. There you go. For any species, saltwater, freshwater, it doesn't matter. You need to hire a local guide, which is fantastic, by the way. I think it's a great idea. I know a lot of people will disagree with me. First of all, it's incredibly cheap. Secondly, if you don't hire a local character while fishing a new you're place, missing out. <laughs> you're missing out on the whole trip. Yeah. And yeah. Then, but the problem is you got to hire an interpreter too, because I tell you that. One, <laughs> <laughs> you had it. What am I doing? Moving them dead just like that snatch movie. <laughs> oh God, I'm not sure about that Newfoundland accent, but anyhow, we'll, we'll take it. We'll take it, Pete. We'll take it. That, uh, that, I think we got that episode online, if I'm not mistaken. And that guy, he had the best accent ever. It was like, oh, my God, how did Angie even understand this guy? He was so classic. You know? I, had, I had an interpreter. You were right. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 With, uh, General Rick Hillier, who is a local hero down there, a, a Newfie, uh, born, raised, a bred, born, raised. And um, he was, uh, the general is, was my host as we oh. traveled around in various parts of Newfoundland. So I honestly, I'm telling you, in a lot of cases, he would turn around to me and tell me what the guy just talked, what, what, what he just said. Oh, I, um, there's no doubt about it. Like what, speaking with you gentlemen today, I've already mentally turned off a little East Coast stuff that I've picked up even not even knowing. But uh, right. yeah, no, there's certainly yeah. some some special things and special uh, stay, uh, sayings rather that, uh, that oh come about that. even I I have to scratch my head and I'll and Google it to be honest but with that's you. what makes the East Coast what it is it makes it, it is 100%. People, those people 100%. are the salt of the earth you know what I mean the whole and it's like you said Ben everywhere out there they're just a different breed they're so nice and and that's all part of it their lingo and it's, it's all a, a, a section of this world that's so friggin awesome you know I'll tell you how something I forgot to mention you love this guys Part of our show, we're doing a web segment where we're going around the entire Maritimes, taste testing and reviewing the best fish and chips. I heard. Nice. This is fantastic. Oh. Come on. Right? I mean, if you're coming to the East Coast, you want to try some fish and chips. Well, you're going to, Fishy's going to tell you which ones, why, and where. I mean, 
That's all. Awesome. We're going to gain some weight. But that's okay. It's worth it. It's for the bigger <laughs> cause. That's what I said. <laughs> Work out a little more afterwards, buddy. That's all. Uh, that's just our yeah. selfishness. That's so, yeah. out. Uh, so just to, to recap the show. So it's called Fish East. Yes, sir. It's a half hour format, a weekly yes, show. Mm -hmm. And it starts on. Uh, um, uh, I, I, want, I want to say December, the week of December 28th is the premiere. So the first, uh, first yeah. of the year. Yeah, and it's not just exclusively on Wild TV. Yes, Wild TV. Okay, you don't know what days it's on yet, or, or any of that. No, stuff? that all that information will be up very soon. We're just going to finalize all the. Uh, so the interesting thing is, we're we're started with a mini series for six of six um, episodes. We are very potentially expanding that. I can't talk too much about that, but there looks like we may be traveling a little bit more than just New Brunswick at this point. And just which more than just New Brunswick, because you got to know locally. Um, and like I said, every province is different with COVID, but um, we recently announced what they call an Atlantic bubble. So right. two weeks ago, ah. uh, Atlantic Canadians are now free to visit yeah. each other's province, but not into Quebec. So so if Pete and I want to come down and enjoy some of that down east fishing, we can't right now? Not right now, no. Oh, it has to be essential travel, essential travel only. And even on essential travel, uh, coming into the province, you'd have to... Uh, yeah, you'd have to quarantine 14 days. Well, I could think uh, of worse places to quarantine. No, yeah, no, for sure. But like, I'll give you an example. My parents want to come visit. They're in Toronto. Uh, for them to come here, they'd have to quarantine 14 days. They're allowed coming here because they were. We have direct family here. Right. Um, but they'd have to quarantine literally for 14 days and report in before even going outside. And, and so. that's because you guys virtually got nothing happening down there in terms of COVID. Zero. Wow! Yeah, Good we, are, we are COVID free basically, and 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 little wonder why. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I got to give it to the people. You know, the government yeah. issued certain things. Yeah, we're we're grumpy about it, but we did it, and it you worked it. exactly. So that's all I have to say. Sometimes the plan works if you adhere to it. You know? Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. How um how is the uh because it's obviously a big factor here. The fact that we're not allowing Americans into Canada has got to be a, it's got to be a fact oh, tourism, right? Yeah. Especially on the East Coast. I mean, a huge portion of it is Americans. You know, we we do border New England, but a lot of uh, a lot of people from Pennsylvania, New York, uh, Massachusetts have actual properties here. Salmon lodges, for one, right? right? Yeah. Um, cottages on PEI, Nova Scotia, so on. Uh, it's affected, you know, tourism heavily. Uh, I mean, we know because we're talking with the tourism people, we're talking with the owners of businesses, we're talking to the owners of restaurants and hotels, and it, like I have a hard time asking them for anything. Yeah, for sure. Oh, eh? sure. You know, back in the day or any other given year when everybody's thriving, you know, hey, can you hook us up with two nights, two rooms? Now it's like, man, we'd love to hook you up with two nights, two rooms, but there's, I have nobody else in the in the building. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Tim yeah. wants to know. Uh, Tim Sturgeon, who's one of our regulars, great, to, great to see you here again, Tim. As it is for all of you today, by the way, I appreciate you joining us. Um, he wants to know what's your greatest fishing success. Great question. I love that. My greatest fishing success was being a kid growing up, saying one day I'm going to be like these guys I see on TV, and to be able to call them anytime I want. Wow. That's my greatest fishing success. Ah, no names it. mentioned, so you'll just have to guess who they are. But I love it. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. That's <laughs> yeah, see, Marlon, uh, Marlon Prince. Did you, have you met Marlon Prince yet, Ben? Out there, Marlon Prince is my neighbor. Ah, no kidding. He lives three minutes down the no road, way. and he just dro he literally dropped off something for me this morning. Oh, great man! I had the pleasure of uh, working yeah, with him down there. Marlon is a weapon. Like he is the oh, yeah. guy when it comes to muskies. And when it like, I don't. Can you tell me anybody else that fly fishes for muskie? Never mind that. I got a story. I got a marlin story to tell you. Yeah. Well, so I was down, and by the way, I'm the one who caught that giant muskie down there. Just, just so that we get the. Record. I thought it was Pete. Yeah, oh, no, Pete, caught, Pete caught the striper because because, because the striper because Pete is your little boy toy. That's no, he's, my, oh, he's my boy toy now. Cool. Okay. That's cool. You see, okay. man. So, so anyway, let him do that stuff. He probably oh, forgot about that yeah. muskie, anyways. Don't worry about that. <laughs> so I was down here fishing musky, and Marlon was kind enough uh, to spend some time with me and and uh, help me with it, obviously. And um, so at the beginning of <laughs> of the day, we we set up all his baits, and he's kind of explaining all the baits. Is and, and and then he says, "Now this one here, this one's kind of a special bait." And um, 
and he told me the story behind it. He says, but you won't need that. You can use all these other ones. You won't, you won't need that one. And so, of course, when somebody says that to you, the only thing you're thinking about is, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What do you mean your special bait? And we won't need that. <laughs> That's not the way it works here, right? No, no. Anyways, bottom line is he, he uh, was nice enough to let me touch the special bait. Oh, and yeah, because because we thought it would it might help the shoot, and um, then I was able to see if he would let the special bait go on a date with me for the day out on the river, and he was nice enough to oblige. But Stephen and I, my co-host that week was Stephen at Wiki. Uh, we we both you know swore up and down that we would not use the special bait unless. Unless it was absolutely necessary. Needless to say, so the show is done. We got the show done, and there's about an hour left to kill. And um, we decided that uh, we should go and try an area that was pretty treacherous. It's a trolling thing down there, trolling pattern. But but there was these three or four humps in relatively deep water. And if you didn't do the turns just so, you know, you were going to hit you were going to hit rocks and stuff and wood and all kinds of anyways as you can imagine what happened we had the special bait on for the end of the day because we hadn't used it all day we got to put it in the water you know and so we did and so i lost marlin's special oh bait. nice very very <laughs> I apologize, nice Mar i apologize to him profusely and uh, we did a hug and he did forgive me so i just oh, want to he's I definitely one of the the chief you know he's the president of the local musky chapter from yeah. Muskie, Canada. Great guy. Uh, great guide. He's, you know, I did an article uh, about him and the different guiding services in and around the Fredericton area. Uh, he's a neighbor and certainly an advocate for, you know, New Brunswick sport fishing anyhow. Absolutely. He taught me basically, arguably, he, he put me on my first fly fishing. We went oh. smallmouth fishing. He taught me how to do that. If, awesome. if anybody that's watching this um, is thinking of when we can, obviously not now, but, you know, thinking of going to the East Coast to do some fishing, you got to look Marlin up. Um, St. Johnny Sox. St. Johnny Sox is his website. Yeah, if you're looking to catch a muskie out there, and those muskies are awesome on that river, let me tell you, and Marlon's the man to get a hold of. He will put you on yeah. it. Sure. By the way, that episode where I caught the big muskie <laughs> was the invasion, just in case you were wondering, Ben. You know. Gotcha. Uh, loud and clear, sir. Loud and clear. Uh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what have we not covered, my friend? Um... Anything else? I mean, I, I, I got out what I really wanted to say, and I'm happy we went through everything we, we, we talked about. Uh, thank you guys for the opportunity, of course. Oh, uh, and, uh, can't wait for you guys to come down. We yeah, whatever it's going down. to be. Obviously, you're going to be the very first person we call. It's uh, going to be weird, eh? Gonna, we're going to travel to the East Coast now to meet up with Ben. Normally, I know, that's strange. It's like, but what the okay. heck? But, uh, God... What's have you heard what's happening on Lake St. Francis this year? Is there anything going on at all? Here's the situation with Lake St. Francis. Here's the news, late breaking news. As of September 1st, the Quebec government has said that, you know, uh, most events can resume. However, if they decide to change that last second, any investment or any money spent promoting said event that would happen after that date, that's on you. Yeah. So... We're in a pickle. We want to do that event so bad. We haven't missed that event in 12 years. You know, everybody wants us to do that event. I want to do that event. We got some challenges. I got the quarantine challenge of traveling cross province. We have yeah. a potential second wave of COVID that's going to happen when the temperatures start dropping. Who knows what that's going to bring? You know, if I had, if I, if I had to say right now, I mean, I'd probably say the safest bet is just, you know what, 2020 is a write-off, you know, at this point. I don't I want to say that. I don't want to say that because every you know, Franny, it's late. It's in, in the fall. But, you know, other events just recently, you know, like we're supposed to go and it didn't happen. And there's reasons for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so Marlon, uh, Marlon says. Uh, ah, there he is. <laughs> speak of the devil. Yeah. Uh, he says, yeah, it was tough to get over that one. And I bet it was. We've all had that favorite date that, you know, you. You don't even throw it in the water anymore. So this thing was sacred. He didn't even want to get it wet, to be honest with you. Okay, so. well, I'll tell you, he's been posting great pics of him and his customers. His his, his partner um, has been absolutely slaying them. She obviously is a stick because 
I see way more pictures of yeah. her holding fish than, than Marlon does, but I don't know. <laughs> she seems to be an absolute hammer. Yeah, for sure. She's funny, too. She's funny too. We had a, we got a great little piece in that show that Angela's talking about, her little interview with her on the on the boat. And it's there's a good little snippet in there, so you got to see it. That's awesome. What a, a great fishery. Ben, have you uh, you've experienced it? The, so the here's my thing with musky. I think Pete has heard me say this, and I'm going to tell you too. I've always told myself, 50. When I turn 50 years old is when I start my musky adventures. Because I know I need to buy eight more rods, eight more reels. I'm going to have to load up all kinds of $200 baits and reach to the deepest depths to find the handmade stuff that works and the <laughs> anti-bucktails. I know the fever that comes with musky, and I cannot, I'm not that guy that does it sort of or halfway. You know yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, what I'm saying is, I need to either put aside a lot of money or get ready for a loan that my wife won't know about to <laughs> really get into musky. Having said that, since moving here, I am surrounded by musky heads. I mean, I cannot go ten minutes on a boat without somebody saying, "When are we going for musky? When yeah. are we doing this? When, wh when are we going to try for some musky?" It yeah. is a thing. There is musky fever in Fredericton yeah, and yeah. St. John River. Um, as there should be, by the way, because I, I've said this publicly. I think I think it is the next uh, musky haven, uh, bar none. Uh, and only I only say that for two reasons. Number one, the forage base down there is so oh. protein heavy and oil rich. Oh my God. I don't care what species it is. Have you seen how fat the muskies are? They're oh, gross. It's gross. And you know the, the best part of. Let's say you're fishing in Fredericton. You're fishing right in front of Fredericton on the St. John River. So you've got a chance at a 30-pound muskie or a 30-pound striper on every cast or every pass of your troll. Either Great. one of those fish can happen. There's that, and there, that, there's that many of both species there at certain times, especially in the fall. Crazy. Absolutely nuts. Uh, I'm going to ask. I'm going to put you guys on the spot because I think East Coasters want to know. What are the top five muskie destinations in Canada? Must hits. Well, I, 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 in terms of uh, the overall experience, yeah, I don't want you to put them in order. Just top five. Yeah. Well, 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 well. That fishery in in uh, Fredericton is is in the top five in my yeah, my estimation for sure. Absolutely. So because because what else is up there. So what does that uh, compare to? What other areas or bodies? Uh, are there? I, I don't know. River still, Eagle. River still. I think Saint still. Lawrence River, which is uh, Lake Saint Francis, obviously oh, is, is yeah. number one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but. Um, Lake I mean, Clair. Lake St. Clair. St. is another one. St. Clair. Lots of muskies on St. Clair. That's probably the number one for numbers. Okay, it's number. The, yeah, okay. it is. It is. But 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 if you're looking for the overall experience and the fishery as a whole, I, I'm not a big fan of that, as you know, but but that's a whole other ballgame. But I want to get back to, to the East Coast musky fishery because it truly is, even though I believe there there are trophies to be caught. And I'm talking record trophies to be caught. I think the reason they haven't been caught, and I and I shared this with uh, Marlon when I was down there, because they're saying down, you know, another couple of years these fish are going to grow, and you know, another five years from now these fish are going to do this. And they're going to, and I said, you've got these fish here now. You've, they're here now. The, the the reason that we haven't heard about a world record being established in on, on, in uh, Canada's uh, east eastern fishery, musky fishery is because we don't have all of the great musky fishermen that we have in all these other lakes. You're right. Fishing. Talent pool. Any... Talent pool. Is what we're Talent talking pool. About. Not yeah, that there's anything pool. wrong with the current ang musky no. angle. But, but the guys here are, are, we can say, are still learning. Whereas we're, there's guys in Ontario and Quebec and everywhere else that have been doing this for 30 years. Exactly. Look at, take a guy like Mike Lazarus. Oh. Put him in Fredericton. What is this guy going to find? Give him, oh a, give him two weeks. You know what? Like guys like that. Just yeah. you know. So, so so I think it's already there. We just haven't had enough sticks, qualified sticks, to really determine what the potential is. But that notwithstanding, we know for a fact that it's a great musky fishery now. Add to that that East Coast flavor, the ambiance, the the the, the character of the fishery, and I put it in the top five without any reservation whatsoever. None. Zero. All you have to do now is lift that damn bubble so we can come down and do it. Well, well we're, we're going to be ready for you. I'll tell you, we're, we're you know, with this fish cheese movement, we're definitely going to showcase the best that we have. We're going to do our very best to do that. And we might surprise. We might surprise. I, I can't even tell you all the interesting things I'm about to do or about to film. But uh, uh, let's just say there's stuff I didn't even know existed that we're about to showcase. 
Excellent. going to be some uh, interesting stuff. Jeff is saying, uh, great co uh, combo, guys. Uh, New Brunswick is where it's at. I'm assuming Jeff is from New Brunswick. Yeah, Rathburn. Like yeah, he's actually one of our Fishies contributors. Oh, is that right? Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. By the way, I'm looking forward to all, all you guys that are with us today that are part of that Fish East uh, uh, website. I'm really looking forward to reading your stuff now that we're hooked up. I'll be on it every day checking stuff out. Hey, we got everything from, you know, fine fine tuning your striper presentations during pre-spawn, spawn, and post-spawn, all the way to how to properly fillet a chain pickerel and prepare that. Have you have you done the uh, uh, the cannabicaceous sturgeon yet? Oh, of course I've done sturgeon alley. How could I live here and not do that? It wouldn't be called an East Coast if they'd kick me out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a little section of the cannabicaceous. Actually, we were just on the cannabicaceous this last weekend with Jeff Rathman, the guy that you just saw come up. But yeah. um, in the spring, I was up there with another buddy. Um, oh, my God. Paul Melanson, who's also known for stripers in the reversing falls of St. John. Yeah. Jigging for stripers in Niagara Falls. Yeah. yeah. It's just stupid. Anyhow, um, crazy stripers. But the interesting thing, because I, you know, I grew up fishing stripers on the St. Lawrence near Montreal, but there's two species of stripers. They have the, the short nose, which we all know, and the Atlantic. No, sturgeon, not stripers. Sturgeon. I'm sorry, not stripers. I meant sturgeon, yes. So they have the short nose sturgeon and, yeah, yeah, sorry. Atlantic sturgeon, which could get absolutely massive. I haven't caught an Atlantic yet, but I did catch some really good size um, short nose ones. Speaking of stripers, have you experienced the uh, Bay of Fundy stripers? That's on our list. Uh, Bay of Fundy has several um, opportunities to look at stripers, both from the New Brunswick side as well as from the, New, uh, the Nova Scotia side. Um, one that we missed this spring that we hope to hit next year is the Stewiak River. It oh, is, um, done it. You've heard we've of that? Done yeah. Oh, we've done it. It's fantastic. Oh, you've done it. Fly, on the fly? No. You can do it from shore. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it's all shore, yeah. We got a guy um, who represents fishies in the in, in Nova Scotia, Matt Cito, specialist uh, on that, and he's got great videos about it as well. Um, but there's also the Bay of Fundy going out into the bay itself, right? Yeah. Um, and then there's also all the northern New Brunswick stuff, like near the Quebec border, like the Bay de Chaleur and the, the Misku Island area. There's, I mean, stripers are everywhere. Hey, stripers are to the east coast what smallies are to ontario right what a great fishery that that's is. really what it is you know they're yeah. everywhere but the only difference is our our stripers can go up to 45 pounds 50 pounds exactly they're giant yeah. they're giants beasts Ugh. such a cool fish too you know? isn't it and oh. they fight hard i mean oh they fight really hard. you put them in an incoming tide oh my god when they're, the, when they're in the feed it's ridiculous you know, yeah. it's just ridiculous i mean yeah. and the size of the baits I mean, we were talking about musky baits you know, when they're on the feet, we're throwing 10, 11, 12 inch presentations with two yeah. ounce jig heads. Yeah. You, need some, you need some gear and some backbone for that. You do. You do for sure. Uh, you know. Adrian uh, has got an interesting question for you, uh, Ben. Uh, he wants to know uh, which fish species do you think will benefit from the lack of fishing pressure? I'm assuming that's what he's saying in the East with the COVID uh, situation. Which fish species I think will benefit from the lack of fishing in the East? I don't, it's funny because you say lack of fishing. I think this is a record year for most fishing permits sold. So I don't think any species is getting a, a vacation right now. I think yeah, I think yeah. people are out there fishing, which is a great thing. And COVID has kind of put people in a position to say, hey, let's get out there. I haven't gone fishing maybe in a couple of years or whatnot. One of the few activities that are available, buy your license, go out there and go fishing. Um, I think maybe a segue from that question is what species might get a little bit more exposure I think chain pickerel is a huge resource for introducing kids to fishing here. Uh, I know chain pickerel isn't that big in, in, in central Canada because we got northern pike and everything out there, but chain pickerel are just aggressive, abundant, and easy to target. And when you're How taking about northern pike, have you got northern uh, pike? No northern pike in, in, in maritimes. Wow. Yeah, so a big ESOX, we go from a, a chain pickerel, average size chain pickerel here would be like two, two and a half pounds, a big one being four, five, six pounds. Um, and it jumps right to musky. There is no northern pike in between. Yeah. Have, you, have you heard about anybody eating chain pickerel? Are they as good oh, as pike? Go to Fish East. We're going to be putting up on how to fillet a cook and catch video. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Delicious. Honestly, the flesh. If I blindfolded you guys and I took the tail section, maybe not the body section, but the tail section and put a heads up against a walleye. Never tell. I don't know. I don't know if you'd be able to taste the difference. No, we wouldn't because it's the same thing with pike. We, we, we can't tell pike and, and walleye still to this day. But chain pickle is even closer than pike. Really? 
because of the, the space between the flakes. I don't know if you understand what I mean. And you know the black veininess to the flesh? It's almost identical. Like I would have a hard time telling the difference. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Now there's a, there a lot of people I talk to here. They say, oh, you know, it's it, we don't like keeping the chain prickle in the summer because they're slimier. I don't know if I can really agree with that. Uh, I mean, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Does it taste better in the, through the ice? Or is that just a myth? I think I think a lot of it is in our heads. I think any fishery probably mentally tastes better through the ice because it's ice. Chilled. It's cold. Chilled. Yeah. Chilled. That's we were used to yeah. serving our food. Funny, we don't have a problem eating perch in the summer, do we? No. no. Oh, I have no problem eating perch in the desert. <laughs> That's, That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. So it's, it's, I don't know. Maybe it's just one of those things. Yeah. Let's take uh, let's take a couple of closing questions and then we'll uh, we'll let you go. I know you're you're busy with the farm down there. Yeah. You know? um, how do you guys see Quebec's dumping of raw sewage into the St. Lawrence River? Yeah, it's an interesting one. We had the, we had the mayor on our radio show when this happened. By the way, oh god, uh, they're now going to do it until uh, 2040. You know, if I was downriver, I'd be some concerned. No kidding. You know, Toronto, you don't have to worry. You're you're above river. But if I'm if I'm three rivers, yeah, which is like forty five minutes outside of Montreal, and I see this giant cloud of Montreal sewage coming my way, I would be concerned. Even Quebec City, a little bit further down from there. I mean, they they say that it washes out. Is there any scientific? I don't know. Yeah, it just know, doesn't sound right. That. It's funny we we. Um... We don't mind hearing about that or, in our case, experiencing those things when we're in some exotic little part of the world where we say, well, those poor people don't have the technology or the, the financial wherewithal to, to, you know, do it properly. They have to dump it. I mean, it's what else? In Montreal, it's the second largest city in the country, for crying out loud. Yeah. Exactly. When we hear, and this was the argument I had with the mayor at the time on air. Um, now, in, in, to his credit, he did tell me it was a temporary thing at the time because they had to rebuild their infrastructure. And so it, I think there was a 60-day period or a 90-day period where they had no other option while they were rebuilding this infrastructure than to dump it straight into St. Lawrence. So, so that was kind of his out. But now, if I'm reading this correctly, this is something that's going to be uh, an ongoing basis. Which well, 2040 is still temporary, buddy. 2024. <laughs> <laughs> They'll only have thirteen heads and eyeballs by then. Oh, God. Wow. Oh, but, no, it's uh, it's hard to swallow, so to speak, yeah. when when it's happening here at home. I, I listen. I first found out about the fact that that there were parts of this country doing that uh, 25, 30 years ago out west, Victoria, on Vancouver really? Island. In fact, oh. when you're flying into Victoria back then, um, you could see it as you're coming into the island. You could see a big swath of dark water. Right off the bottom end of Vancouver Island. Right into the ocean. Right raw. Every day. Every oh, yeah. day. Gross. Yeah. yeah. See, our, our problems out east here aren't necessarily that. I mean, there is a I mean, there's a lot less industry on the river. You know what I mean? There's the beautiful thing about the Maritimes is literally you could be ten minutes from a major town city and feel like you're in the woods. And you know, in Ontario and Quebec and Central Canada, you gotta go pretty freaking far to not feel industry. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but what we're, we're, we're dealing with with our salmon and the water temperatures going up and all, there's so many things like I don't want to get into because I'm not educated enough to make a proper assessment of it. But certainly um, the temperature of the waters have definitely seemed to be a culprit in the, the salmon fishing, which is and, and it's not something that is just uh, uh, on Canada's east coast. Atlantic salmon are having problems all over the world. OK, so if, if it is connected to temperature, it's certainly a global event. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not something on us at all. Fair enough. Uh, so, yeah. uh, my friend, I can't tell you how how wonderful it was having you on. I can't tell you how much better I feel that we have kind of uh, opened the door uh, to the East Coast. Albeit, you're not allowing us to come down there because we, you think we're all infected. But that's fine. Stay two provinces over for now. Anyhow, <laughs> we don't want you over here. I think I speak on behalf of all East Coasters when I say that. Stay the bleep home for now. We don't want you. Well, when you need us, when you uh, need us. Oh, really yes, 100%. Very best would be well, open arms. You can come on down for sure once once everything is under control. Awesome. There's yeah. a reminder for uh, folks who go to fishingcanada.com. Make sure that you click on to the Fish East 
a button that is now on our main red ribbon across the top of the site. It will link you directly to uh, the Fish East site and uh, expose you to some of the greatest fishing tales and stories and experiences that, uh, that you probably will ever have. Um, and it'll uh, really spark your appetite to visit. Yeah, maybe learn something. Maybe learn something, you know? Why, sure you Why not? I learned something today. Chain pickle is better than pike. There you go. Hands yeah. down. I, I, would, I, would, I would eat chain pickle any day over pike. Not that pike's not good. Sorry. Okay. White perch or yellow perch? Or yellow. Uh, yellow perch. I like white, white perch. White perch, hands down. No, you're, you're White you're, perch. You're oh, man. This might be another episode, but white perch for me. Is like a baby striper. Veal. You're having veal. You're having veal striper. But it's, the, it's so good. It's so much. It's, <laughs> it's 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 okay. We'll say this for another day. But I'm just saying, okay. white, white perch. I we don't have black crappie out here, and you know I'm a crappie head. Yeah. White perch have completely replaced crappie for me. There are giant white perch slabs out here. How big? Nice. I'm talking pan. Like like picture a big crappie. Same thing, but a white perch. Oh, that's awesome Good for you. Plates, dinner plates. Nice. Big. Oh, big. Right. I'm catching them on four-inch smallie swim baits. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Good all right? You. And lipping them, double fisting. Good for you, buddy. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Want pictures, okay? Send us oh, they'll, they'll be up there. Okay. Just another reason for us to come visit, my friend. As soon as we're all well, uh, expect us on your doorstep. Absolutely, absolutely. Ben, thank you very much, buddy, and uh, all the best to you and yours. Stay safe, stay well, and uh, let's stay connected. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, thanks a lot, guys. All right, Pleasure. take care, buddy. Uh, ben Wu, Ben Wu from uh, certainly most of us know him from B One, but I think we're going to be uh, in the future eating some of his delicacies that he's raising on that. I like this. Uh, imagine a trip to Bam. We go have some trout. We go have some white perch, some some chain pickerel, and we get some quail eggs. We get, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you win. it just dawned on me. He he didn't leave us his address. <laughs> There's a reason for that. <laughs> <He's a visitor>. <laughs> <laughs> we forgot. We did. We forgot the lightning round with Ben. Damn it. Oh, oh okay. damn. Well, yeah. All yeah. right. So quick, but that's okay. Whose fault was that? My fault that I screw up. No, people, not really. No, no, I, I can accept that. Keep in mind, though, I, I've been under a lot of trauma here because I was, uh, at the beginning of the, the program, my, my laptop blew up. You're on a whole new computer, so you're, you're like, starting from scratch again, aren't you? This I'm starting from scratch. Yeah. This is at, one. I'm all fuzzy and blurry and stuff. Like, I know, that's not right. It's just not, life isn't fair sometimes, does it, buddy? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, things there with Ben. Obviously, we didn't push the issue, but, uh, you know, we will mention it now that, that uh, some a lot of the things that uh, Ben would have liked to have said, and we would have liked to have said, quite frankly, uh, we we were uh, not able to because there is an ongoing investigation. Uh, there are some there's even some charges apparently uh, that he is looking at facing if things don't go his way on this whole investigation. So, you know, we were kind of treading on uh, on thin ice. A lot of you were screaming and yelling saying ask him ask him this or ask him that well yeah well we would have loved to but we knew going into the interview he wouldn't be able to answer him anyways so yeah yeah you know. uh enough uh, about that uh, uh, suffice to say that that um it was a tragedy a disaster it will uh, forever change the way we look at tournament fishing i think uh, in in uh in this part of the world, certainly in this country, if not in North America as a whole. Uh, but a lot of people might say that's a good thing. You know, those 300 and some odd fish that died, maybe, maybe, you know, if you can turn it around and say it was a good thing, maybe that's, that's the way we need to look at it because it's changing. Uh, certainly the, the major league fishing folks have, uh, have turned that leaf, right? They've done a great job at, uh, at still holding, creating huge tournaments, huge money tournaments, and very safe for the fish. So, you know, ultimately, that may be the way to go, right? That's like you say, that might be a lesson that Ben and his team learns, and they all of a sudden, they hold, they hold the safest tournaments of all. Who knows, right? So, Yeah, I kind of, it's going to be a while for me to, mentally to get over that whole, you know, the, the way in process with people, and, and, and I don't know. I don't know. But, but hey. Things change. You know, but 
<laughs> how, how much more than changing than wearing a mask every time you go out somewhere? Yeah, huh? yeah. I, I forgot my mask yesterday walking in someplace. I felt like an idiot. I said, well, oh, no, I had to go back and get a, get a mask. You know what I mean? It's, it's just, it's weird. Yeah. Have you uh, run into any of these wild stories that I'm reading about, you know, people losing their minds while they're out in public, uh, mm -hmm. complaining about other people not wearing masks and having uh, confrontations and that kind of thing? No, I haven't. I have not uh, encountered any of that as of yet so far. Uh, I, I, I always thought you were going to say the opposite of the people that say, I don't have to wear a mask because on you, I know I'm not, I'm not going to wear a mask and all that. So I'm sure those are out there too complaining, you know, that, you know, those are the ones that need to be bitch slapped so, and say, shut up. But, you know. So here's my thinking on that. And, and this is probably a pretty good time to, to say this. My thinking is this. It may or may not prevent us from spreading and catching COVID. It may or may not. I don't know for a fact. I don't think there's any. I haven't seen the science yet that tells me it will or it won't. However, I can't help but thinking. This is the old catch and release theory. Uh, about people saying, yeah, well, you guys are catching and releasing all those fish, but how many of them real, really live? And, and my answer to that is always 100% of the fish we put back stand a chance of living versus the ones that we don't put back. They're not living for sure. So to me, wearing a mask is exactly that. I'm not sure if it's working or not, but it sure as hell looks and feels like we're doing something to prevent it rather than just go out and, and, and spew, spew your stuff all over the place. Exactly. If you're if it's an airborne from your mouth, then it's the same. Yeah, you're right. Really, the same as catch and release fishing like that. If it's an airborne from your mouth and you're covering your mouth, chances are you're covering out. You know, you're you're helping the cause. Yeah. So, yeah. anyways, just thought I would throw that out there. Can we get um, back to some fishing. Anybody with fishing questions? We can end this on uh, anything we can uh, look at. Mikey, has there been anything interesting in the world of fishing out there? That's the one. <laughs>
I'll tell you, I even went as far as to make some phone calls of people that might have had access to that image because it, it, it didn't come from us. So my question to you, Calvin, is where did you get it? Great shot, by the way. I love it. And 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 I, I called Reno today to see if he had uh, I mean, coveralls on him. <laughs> and as much as I have absolutely, I had absolutely no idea where that was shot, when it was shot, what it was for, or anything else. He knew it right away. So I got a feeling he's involved somehow. Reno and you are. are so where, where was it? Where was the shot? So that apparently was in uh, uh, the Bay of Quinty somewhere. Those fish were caught um, in the Deserando area. Get the uh, hell out of here. And hang on. And it gets even better. So, and Reno knew this right off the bat. Like he just, so we had with us on a non tournament day, we were all just meeting there just for fun. We had Pokaluck and Clements. We had uh, Tom Brook. And a fishing partner of his. Um, we had uh, Fitzgibbons and Askin. Oh boy, there's a team. We had uh, Crawford and um, uh, Sion. Uh, oh, remember Dr. Sion? Phil Sion. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyways, these are the who's who of the fishing industry. I'm going back 40 years ago or so, and we just all called each other and, and met up there in Deserano, spent the day on the water fishing for smallmouth. And so my question to Reno was, what in the hell were we putting all those fish on the stringer for? And he says, because we had a fish fry. We all had a fish fry. We had a smallmouth fish fry, the whole bunch of us. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, that is freaking awesome. Yeah, so that's the uh, story. But I want to know, where'd you get that picture, Cal? Like, well, he still hasn't come back with it. Maybe Calvin's hiding now. He said, oh, shit. I got a plagiarism here. What's going on? I got uh, I'm thinking more he might have been following us back then. He was in the bushes taking pictures. <laughs> that's Calvin's face. If that came out of Calvin's camera, buddy, you are in trouble. <laughs> anyway, thanks for posting that, buddy. That was uh, that was fantastic. Uh, Andrew Pete, where is the best place to buy preserved minnows for a fly-in fishing trip? Wow, that's a fantastic question because I have no idea. Where I know be. where they have them, whether it's the best place to buy them or not, I don't know. And that is at sale. Um, they have the little jars of preserved minnows. In fact, they even have colored ones, which is kind of cool because it must be something relatively new. They've got like chartreuse colored ones. They've got... Really? Uh, yeah. Now... Now, whether I would use those and put them in the environment, because we really don't know what. Although it, it, it must be, it must be some kind of food diet or something. I don't know. Oh yeah, but, cool. I, I've never seen that before. There you go, Calvin. Oh, Calvin. I can recall. I got a number of those pictures, Fishing Canada article somewhere. So somehow. In an article, maybe the newspaper, maybe Fishing Canada News back in the day, or ah, something like that. Because we checked, Calvin. We had uh, we had everybody on board when we saw those. We I wanted to know where those pictures came from, where that uh, image came from, and we checked high and low here, and we don't have that image scanned anywhere. And then, and by the way, Calvin, Angelo is going to invoice you for all the time that his, his employees took to look for that picture. So just to let you know, you got a little uh, invoice coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding uh, that was a good shot actually that was cool so so anyways there you go buddy your your uh your your calvin investigation can is it gonna rest easy now or are you gonna still uh, it depends what he comes up with next okay uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, that's great that's uh tim any word on episodes uh in the can so far this year yeah we have word on them pete you want to share the word on them we well, we got uh, we have two episodes in the cans. Right. So let's just say two full episodes in the can and uh, and working on more. But we're we're still having uh, a lot of issues. Ange and I talked again this week about staying in motels. Let's just say you can't go out of province. So we'll stay in Ontario here and just staying in a, a very populated. So some of these places are open right now. They're getting people in all the time and all that. They've still got this chance of um, are they disinfecting the motels properly? I'm assuming they would. You're hoping they would, but are they? 
right? So there's uh, still some travel issues going on and uh, with our team here too. So we talked about uh, possibly because at some point we have to make a decision, you know, um, and I mentioned to you before, one of the most difficult parts that I'm having personally on this is that, you know, I cannot in all good conscience tell our team we're going on the road. Although I'd love to, because it's our, you know, it's, it's the business that we're in and that's what we need to do to generate income, but I just can't do it. I just, I, I, I can't say to anybody, uh, pack your bags guys we're we're hitting the road so i think uh i think once i get beyond that and um and the rest of the team you know is in tune with it we'll, we'll hit the road until then we're coming up with ways of of doing it differently one of the things that pete and i talked about is maybe maybe we do it you know uh from a motorhome you know, maybe we go back to what we did. I think it was about 10 years ago, Pete. Oh, that was awesome. We had a riot doing that. You know what I mean? That was cool. That was that was an experience in itself. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that, that's a chance. Now, now, we didn't live in the motorhome, but we traveled in it. We, we traveled to the places, then go to lodges or motels or hotels or whatever like that. But but to stay in that, uh, yeah, Tim Sturgeon, RV sponsorship. You're right, Tim. Maybe we should, we need to look into something like that. Um, we're, you know, we're definitely, as well, like, as we were talking about earlier on with the fishing Canada.com start to strap on a, a camera here and there, just even when fun fishing, you know, some of that stuff I shot is just, I was just going to go out anyway. I thought, you know what, let's strap on a camera and maybe we'll see if anyone goes. If, if people are liking that, um, I think Calvin, again, he said today there would be a great addition to the fishing Canada show to have those little the double kind of uh, shooting. So we get the real good professional shooting done with the big cameras, but you can have it in your interject some of that stuff too. But if you guys are enjoying that kind of stuff, let us know. And we'll, we'll do more of that in the meantime too. You know, we got, we have to keep the dot com site going too. And it's, it's fresh and it's fun for us. We'll do it. You know, if you like it, if you don't like it, tell us and we won't do it too. If you just, you know, if it's a negative and ah, I hate that stuff either way. I don't think anybody will hate it. You know, no, I think, I think it's more of an internal thing here because we're, we're in the broadcast business. It just seems kind of, uh, I don't know. Amateur, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. But, but in the same sense, it's, it's the reality too, right? It's the reality of being on the boat with Angela Viola on a day and Ange and Nick went out fishing just for, uh, and wanted to take him out to show him his first brook trout. He's never caught a brook trout before. All of a sudden, it's, you, let's not worry about the TV, but you still shoot the reality of it too, which is kind of cool. So, you know. If people like it, let's know. Who knows? We're we're uh, we've never been where we are, so who knows? Yeah. Ever since the Eagle River in Labrador, no, but uh, I've heard all kinds of great stuff uh, about the Eagle. Do you remember Randy uh, Jennings or Jenkins? No, Jennings. Sorry, Randy Jennings that used to work for us years ago. Yeah. Um, him and uh, Alf Walker did an episode. Alfie Walker, yeah, him and Alfie down uh, in the early years of Fishing Canada and shot there, and they shot at another place. They, they were on the Eagle, and then another one called Sand River. They did a, a double shoot, um, so yeah, some great stuff. What was it, brook trout or salmon or? or? Uh, sea run uh, brookies in one, and Atlantics in the other. Oh man, those sea run brookies. That's very interesting, eh? That whole sea run brook trout thing. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. What are you thinking of? You're laughing. All of a sudden, you got something that just went through your melon right there. Yeah, the, the, the thing that I re, I'll never forget. I missed that. Ep I missed going out on that shoot. But when they came back, uh, I'll never forget. Even though they had been in this most pristine, beautiful, wild environment, you know, uh, and and how both of them were so looking forward to to the trip and and. Oh, why not? The, the thing that they talked about most when they came back uh -oh. was the black flies. <laughs> I'll never forget it as long as I live. Oh, I yeah. guess the black flies, it was like a wall of black flies. Oh, and, man. And when they were doing their on cameras, the most difficult part was not coughing it up because they were swallowing so many black flies when they'd open it. <laughs> oh, God. Can you imagine? Oh my God! I'll never forget it as long as I live. Do you remember the flat, the bugs when we were up in the Cambridge Bay? Remember those clouds of bugs, those what? funnel clouds of mosquitoes or whatever, or black flies, whatever they were. Tell that folks, was not. Tell folks about that. Well, we just, I mean, we had no idea. We're going way up. We're in Cambridge Bay, so we're in the tundra, right? There's no 
well, there's some hills and stuff like that, but basically it's pretty much flat land. I mean, there's, there's no trees at all in the tundra. And then we got to this one little lake. It was an inland um, char lake. And we just sat there. We, we were by the plane or the ATVs because the plane lands right in the tundra and all that. We were just sitting there and we looked in the, and we thought there were clouds or funnel clouds of rain or something like that. And we were just, you know, we didn't think nothing of it. And then we asked one of the guys, what, what the hell is they funnel clouds? Or he says, no, but they were bugs. Those are bugs over there. Like, what? And there'd be these stacks of millions of bugs every 30 feet, every 100 feet. It was just that most unbelievable thing we've ever seen. It was just there were so many of them. Mini tornadoes. Yeah, that's what they looked like. Little and they're just moving across the, the, the land, right? They were just... Oh, yeah, they were seg- the weird part is they were segregated from each other. There'd be all kinds of stacks. They weren't. They wouldn't go together. They no. just a little group and just yeah. the other one do the same thing. It was weird. Like you're talking millions and millions of bugs at one time. So, oh my God, uh, David wants to know: Have you ever driven by a creek and wondered what fish might be in there? All the time, man. Yeah, creeks, rivers, uh, uh, little ponds. It's an ongoing question that we oh, have. Read it, but read it. Just then decide to try it and genuinely surprised at what you caught. If so, where? What did you guess? I remember, I remember a couple of times, like when I, when me and my dad, when he was teaching me to fish and we were used to fish a lot, we were always looking for brook trout, for, you know, always looking at these little creeks for brookies. And they, you'd be surprised at the stupid little spots that brookies would be in. They'd be like, oh my God, there are brook trout in this thing? There's no way. You know, creeks that are you know, a foot and a half, two feet wide at some places, and they have brook trout in them. So that'd be the the uh, the nice part, the positive. The other surprise that I've often had back in those days, especially moving back, moving a little farther west, that was sort of the Napanee area north of Napanee. As I got towards the GTA and all that, is is you're going in these creeks thinking you're going to just slay the trout, and you start catching suckers, you know, big chubs and suckers like these suckers that surprise the hell out of you. Or even up in Essendagami Lodge, Ants, that's how you weren't on that trip. There was the Essendagami River, it's full of specks. You're sitting there drifting your little jigs and whatever you're using, all of a sudden, boom, you get onto these suckers and say, like, what are you doing in here? So I've been surprised by suckers many times in those in those creeks and disappointed, but whatever. It's part of the game, right? We'll take it. I think I, I told this story uh, on here before. One of my adventures to that question was in Algonquin Park. We uh, A group of us used to go in twice a year and, and, and portage in to the the back lakes and stuff. And um, this one year we decided to, uh, and, and back then, you know, there was very little information and certainly no GPS. We had to go off of topo maps, right? And all they had in these topo maps were basically an outline of, of the lake. Uh, and, and so anyways, so we had picked out this route and halfway through our, our, our planned trip, there was this other little lake kind of way off the beaten path that would take us an extra day in and an extra day back uh, on our on our scheduled uh, path that we thought we'd try. It was called Round Lake, right? Yeah. Tiny little speck of water, and we didn't know whether we would find any fish or not, so we did. We went in, and the majority of the fish that we were catching back then in the park, or certainly the lakes that we were going into, were lakes that were stocked with splake. So for every 10 fish that you caught, uh, seven of them were splake, two of them were rainbow, and one would be a speckle. That's how odd, you know, it was. So anyways, we go into this lake and started fishing it. And all of a sudden, we were catching splake after splake after splake. I mean, and they were, you know, a pound and a half, two pounds, which was really good fishing. And um, so about time that we had to head back, I caught this massive splake that I estimated to be about eight pounds, seven, eight pounds. And yeah, back then we kept a lot of our fish because that was what we ate during these trips, right? We would, we would, we would have it for breakfast, lunch, and supper. So anyway, so, so we come out of that lake and um, we brought three fish out of that lake the one big eight pounder and then two that were, you know, two to three pound. And that night, or maybe on the way out of the park on that trip, I can't remember what, it, what the situation was, but, but uh, M&R would have uh, biologists, conservation officers, and a group of uh, young student biologists that would go into everybody's camp uh, while you were in the park. And they would, you know, do surveys, creel census, ask you questions, but really conservation officers were there 
because if anybody broke the laws, they were going to bust your ass. And so we were really careful on uh, the n number of fish that we were keeping. Anyways, they came in and you had to lay all your fish out in the open so they could be counted. And you also had to claim before they did any counting, they would, they would say, okay, so who owns what? Because you had to be within your own, you know, <laughs> who owns what? <laughs> So anyway, so we did all that, and they uh, we were bang on, or we might have been one or two over. I can't remember the the final outcome, other than the fact that the one biologist that was uh, looking at that big fish I caught, he said, "Man, that's that's huge, isn't it?" I said, "Yeah, it's the biggest flake I've ever seen in the park." And he looked at me like with a look in his face, like, "Are you an idiot or what?" He says, "That's not a flake. That's a speck." <laughs> so. I mean, it just obviously broke my heart and everybody else. Everybody at that moment went quiet because not only did we look stupid, but we felt absolutely terrible for killing that fish. I mean, oh, uh, a fish that big in an awkward park, my God, that's that's like a, a once in a lifetime. Yeah, but yeah. That was one of those lakes where we didn't know what was in it and if there was anything in it at all. That big fish, though, I'm not making any excuse, but that fish could have been done at spawn, if it didn't spawn at all. I don't know. I mean, it could have been done. It could have been sterile by then. You know what I mean? Because that's that's the oldest probably fish in the whole park you caught there. You know what I mean? That's the they also were very surprised to see a speckled trout in that lake because they said at the time yeah. that that lake was not a very fertile or, or not fertile. Um, in order for speckled trout to spawn successfully, and this is why Algonquin Park has such a a high um, spawning population of speckled trout. Uh, it, it needs to be just the, a certain type of, of uh, terrain and uh, a substructure because they can only spawn in areas where you've got an upflow of cold spring water coming up through the uh, substructure. And that's where they'll spawn in these lakes. And that lake, that little round lake that we went to was a swamp. So there was a whole bunch of things that was weird about that whole fish being there. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Nonetheless, I wish we hadn't done that, but it is one of those things, right? Uh, after heavy rains resulting in fast current in rivers, do you fish the head or head into the current or downstream? Do the fish tend to head into the current or downstream? Mm -hmm. So I think what Neil is asking, and I could be wrong, um, after a rainfall where the current speed picks up and water level picks up, do they actually move from where they would be? And if they do move, are they heading north or south, up or down river, I guess is the question. Great question. Obviously, the body of water that we're talking about would have a tremendous, uh, if we knew where what, what you were talking about location-wise, it would be a big help. Um, I got to say that I would think they would head up as opposed to down unless we're talking a very shallow uh, river or stream or creek that has, say, steelhead in it. Steelhead will tend to drop back a little bit. But we're talking, you know, brookies, uh, brown trout, um, even rainbow trout to a certain extent. I would guess they would move forward. But steelhead in, in some of our local rivers will actually wash down as opposed to moving up. And I'll add to this that I've been very surprised at the amount of current that feeding trout will sit in. They're not behind a boulder a lot of times. They're not. They're in rifts and runs of the fastest water when they're out aggressively feeding. They're waiting for that food to come down. So don't be. Don't think that oh this is too much for them because it's gained uh, another quarter of the speed that it has. As long as there's nice cleanish water where they can see, those guys will get out there and feed too. So. And, and and I don't know necessarily that this pertains just to trout, uh, because I know for a fact it also pertains to bass. Uh, they'll definitely feed for the most part in the front of the current area as opposed to behind it. So I'll think in terms of uh, an obstruction or an island or a boulder or something in the water of the current area that you're fishing. We've all been taught to believe that the best place to fish is behind that obstruction in that eddy because the hydraulics are such that there's calm water back there uh-uh they're at the front in most cases they're at the front of it not behind it so this would be a, a case in point if you've got water uh moving at a quicker rate and at a higher level i would think 
upstream as opposed to down or the front as opposed to back. Hope that helps. Oh, uh, I've done lots of moping when I'm not catching them. I mope all the time. <laughs> Damn wall, I heard biting. Is that mopping or mope? What is that? I've, I've seen you mope when you're doing well, even. <laughs> Damn it, is it lunchtime yet? <laughs> Uh, Lodge wants to know. I don't even know what that is. That Ted, is that Ted, do you think, or is that uh, uh, Ted, Lodge? It's probably Ted. Ted. Ted would tell us it's Ted. I I've think. never heard of moping or mopping for walleye. I have used a mop jig for a largemouth bass, a mop flipping jig, which is a longer stranded like a, for fall fish. It's kind of a bigger profile, but I've never heard of, of that for walleye. So uh, call me uh, out, of out of the times or whatever, but maybe they, they can explain a little bit of that one when they, when they come back on it. I've never done it, so. Nor have I. There you go. You can carry on with your, how you caught that big eight pounder that you killed. <laughs> yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not a murderer. Uh, you know about this stuff more than anybody, so. Well, I, I've got a, you know, and once again, I'm sure, I'm sure, and I've written many blogs on this particular uh, uh, issue. Confidence is everything. It, it doesn't matter what form of fishing you're doing. Confidence is, to me, 75% of the game. If you are confident in what you're throwing and the way you're throwing it and where you're throwing it, you stand a real good chance of catching a fish. Now, the fish have to be there. So that's, that's the most important element. But beyond the color, beyond the style of presentation of bait beyond the profile of the bait beyond the action of the bait the f the f most important thing is that you have to believe what you're throwing is going to work so my go-to bait in algonquin park only because i have 100 percent confidence in it and it has stood me well for for almost three decades and that is an, a little spoon called an egb and i've introduced pete to them on several occasions out in the field they are the most extraordinary little weapon for trout, and it, but in particular, speckled trout that you will ever find. Hard to buy them. I don't even know, you know, where there's ever a good supply of them. But they're called the EGB. They're pricey too, right? They're kind of expensive, aren't they? Compared oh, to crazy expensive. Yeah, crazy expensive. Yeah, but they're an incredible little bait. So it's a spoon, um, not unlike. Uh, you know, most spoons, although probably the most important feature it it has is totally unique to it. And I think it's patented. It was bad. The original patent on this bait was either the late 1800s or the early 1900s. And it's got a little triangular shaped little, we'll call it a, a swivel, a snap, whatever you want to call it. At the end of the spoon, there's a little triangular little piece of bronze wire. And then it's got a double twist on it. Um, and this is where you tie your line to. And this, this odd looking triangular little swivel is what gives this bait its magic. It, it just absolutely runs flawlessly, never twists your line. But more importantly, it has such – the action drives you crazy just looking at it. Uh, it comes in a variety of different sizes and colors, although – the copper or bronze with black and red dots and stripes seems to be the best. It does come in a variety of colors. I don't think the colors is as important as the action on this bait. So EGB either tipped or without anything on it, although sometimes throwing a bit of a worm uh, uh, on the end of it is just that extra little step that, that you need. And, and it catches fish when others won't. That I can tell you with, with total certainty. But once again, I believe in this bait. So, it's you know, like I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it on uh, online here. It's for sale still. So they're out there in different stores. Like that sale thing has some. You can get them online. Uh, EGB itself, I believe. So you can get them. You can find. I, them. I think it comes originally from Germany, if I'm not mistaken. The origins of the bait, but I. I yeah, it's European. Yeah. Yeah. Be wrong about that, but it, it is uh, my number one bait. Aside from that, you can pretty much throw anything um, in those in, in Algonquin Park. Uh, you're going to get some fish for sure, for sure. There's Hawk Lake again, Pete. Dead sticking deep baits, usually dead minnows. Wow, dead sticking deep baits. 
It's Why dead. not? It's usually dead minnows. Well, of course, yeah. When you think about it. <laughs> Why we, wouldn't it work? We've caught, we've caught uh, our, our biggest northern pike on the deadest bait that you're ever going to throw. They were frozen saltwater bait. We got them in fresh water. So, uh, you know what I mean? And those big tuna, we're catching those on a lot of time on the dead stuff, too. We just dropped the dead. So, so uh, yeah, that would make sense. I've never done it, though. Um, sounds Sounds interesting. I guess that would be sort of the be all end all if they aren't hitting uh, live bait rigs if they aren't hitting spinner rigs or anything like that you want to sit right on them they're not hitting a drop shot with a live leech or something i guess you could uh, you know the only thing i would uh, add to that uh, even though it's dead um before you go into any lake you should check the local uh, rules and regulations there's there's some places that even dead minnows are not allowed so uh, always be careful with that be careful on, uh, nowadays, and especially now, because apparently I just heard that Ontario might be segregating the province into four quarters for live bait, and you cannot bring in live bait from any other area. So you better be making sure, uh, like in fishing regulations now, you, two things you got to look at are the live bait issues and the size of the fish that you're allowed to keep issues. So you, you stay in tune with your MNR regulations, folks, because uh, there's some important information on there if you don't want to get in trouble. So. Um, here's a pretty easy one. George Cassidy. Oh, okay. James uh, Hans says, uh, what your favorite, what's your favorite back lake in Southern Ontario? Southern Ontario. A back lake in Southern Ontario. Southern Ontario. Don't really fish a whole lot of them, really. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know what the problem is? We've forgotten more than we, re we remember. Oh, you, 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 if, we brought, if we brought up a map or something, you'd look and say, oh, yeah, that, oh, sh oh do you remember that one, Ange? Oh, sh yeah, exactly. That's the problem with that, stuff like that, you know. So I, I really couldn't tell. I could think about that and uh, and go from there, but I don't know. I got to come right off the. Right What's off the best type of jig to use for Rice Lake and or a Lake Scugog? Woo! Let's, let's make some assumptions. First of all, if we're talking Lake Scugog, we're obviously talking bass. Yeah, exactly. Right now, yeah. Walleye, right? <laughs> so let's go bass, scugog, walleye, rice. How's that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so you're gonna throw your flipping jig on scugog for your for your bass, right? I mean, let's let's be honest. You still can't beat a flipping jig. You know what I mean? And a, a nice, you know, maybe a half ounce size or close to seven sixteenths half ounce is gonna. I mean, scugog's shallow, but there's lots of weeds. You throw a flipping jig with a nice uh, matching trailer, like a chunk trailer or something like that. That's your largemouth job. And I know what Andrew's gonna say for his rice walleye. I know what he's got in his. Is well, and, and, and it would be the same thing that I would use on scugog. If it was we would fish for walleye on scugog, right. which we all know we cannot. Right. So, but I would use it on scugog as well. But moving to Rice Lake, you know, I think the next big thing is going to be a recycling of bucktail jigs. I I really believe that bucktail is going to play a very big role in certainly in walleye fishing moving forward over the next four or five years. Uh, ripping, rip jigging bucktails in weeds. And is there a better body of water than Rice Lake to do that on, Pete? No kidding. No kidding. If it, the fish are, that's loaded with fish. They're in the weeds where rip jigging works best. And there's there's a lot of fish and there's big ones too. Rice Lake has got some big ones. Now there there's also, if you can pull it off, bucktail is still the best. Like Angela says, number one, that's why I knew he was going to choose that bait. But Little shad body baits that look like uh, more perch than anything. Sorry, but you know, like a two to three inch shad, not big ones, small ones. And you basically you put them with a keeper on the on the jig head so that it sticks on the rock, and you put a little crazy glue on top of that. So it really sticks because you're you are fighting the weeds. But if you're fishing the front weeds, the fringe weeds, and just talking about these, you can get back in with a bucktail. It's not going to do anything. You're going to just rip through it. and You're going to get rid of the weeds. If you're fishing the fringe weeds, those little shad bodies with a little just a nice gentle lift and drop. And you can find, you can weasel your way through the weeds. If you pick a weed up, you give it a little pop, and usually it'll come through. So they come through quite well, too, but a, a little shad body. But the best one still is, a, you know, a dark-colored bucktail, a black bucktail with a little red or blue or chartreuse on it or something. Oh, yellow and black. Yeah, can't, you know, hard to beat. Banana-shaped head. It's the best. I know what they're screaming at us right yeah. now, saying, yeah, but, you know, you can also use uh, those uh, small little uh, – uh, plastic skirted jigs that you would use for smallmouth bass, which they're right. Those little, you've seen them, Pete, those great little small weedless uh, smallmouth bass jigs and, and put some rubber on the back. That'll work too. 
Yeah, sure you could. I'm sure you could. But but if you want number one, and I'm assuming that's what you're asking, number one on Rice Lake for walleye. And by the way, a presentation that's probably underutilized on that lake. So that means you've got a bit of an advantage of your rip jigging because not everybody's out there doing that. On Rice Lake, it's it's meat hunting for the for the best part you know people are out there with with live bait and they're and they're anchored down and you know around the weed bed and just letting it sort of sit out there uh and and have walleye come to it well when you go a uh, rip jigging you're on a mission you're you're and what's great about rip jigging to me it's very much like bass fishing you're hunting you're not waiting for them to come to you you're going into where they live and that is in the weeds and it's a great form of uh, walleye fishing that i think over the next four or five years we're going to hear a lot more about it. And it's an old school technique. We, I mean, we were using this 35, 40 years ago. So. And I, and I was going to say, and it's not going to die. That technique is going to live forever. Now, nope. tail jig ripping is going to live forever. As long as there's weeds, wall in the weeds, you're going to catch them for sure. You ever considered a kayak fishing episode? Um, we have talked about it. Hey, every time we go through the boat show and see these fantastic kayaks, we're saying, God, that'd be. Uh, have we not? Yeah. Have we not shot a kayak show? I don't think so. I don't right. remember. Seems to me. Oh, we didn't we? We went kayaking. Uh, we went kayaking on an. Oh, that was Outdoor Journal. Lake Superior. No, Lake Superior. Superior. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and uh, on Fishing Canada, we've done float tube and we've done canoe. Yeah. But yeah, maybe we haven't done kayak. So as soon as, as, as Prince Crap makes a kayak, we're gonna get out there and do it for you, okay, folks? Just to let you know. <laughs> Until then, maybe we can't be doing that. <laughs> what are you saying? Hey, uh, eh? I'm saying we're loyal to our sponsors. We we like our we like our companies that we work with. So. Quick, a quick story about that, if I could, just uh, might be a bit of humor for folks. Back a uh, hundred years ago, we were sponsored by a company called Pradco. Big, big plastic uh, lure and crankbaits, and I mean, in fact, they were into everything. They owned they owned the brands like Zero Spook and Hedden and like Cotton Cordell and Rebel, and I mean, they owned them all, right? All the big brands, and they were paying us a, a very considerable amount of money to shoot our Fish in Canada episodes with their baits, like like most companies, you know, do. And I remember this funny story because the marketing director for the company was an expatriate Canadian uh, uh, who uh, who ended up with this great job running this this the marketing for this company. Anyways, I was at an ICAST uh, one year, uh, and he he uh, called me over to the back of the booth into a little private room, and he says, hey, listen to something. I, I really love what you guys are doing with the Fishing Canada show, and we really value our partnership and, and uh, everything else. But he says, he says, the next time you decide that you should use live bait on the show, perhaps you should ask God to sponsor you. <laughs> it won't be me. Yeah. Good point. Done. <laughs> Upset. <laughs> I got it. I said, Jim, uh, I got it. I knew exactly what he was talking about because that year we shot an episode using, I believe, minnows. Yeah, and uh, when we could have been using, you know, one of their baits, but but for some reason or other, uh, we ended up using minnows on that shoot. And he said, maybe you should talk to God about sponsorship next year if you're going to do more of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. See, uh, well, go ahead. Any uh, any ideas why Alberta does not have bass? Is it because the lakes are too shallow or the water is too cold? That's a very interesting question, Sandy. And uh, I can guarantee it's not because they're too shallow because bass live in shallow. It's not because they're too cold because we have bass in our lake trout lakes up here. So it's definitely not those two. That's are we sure we have no bass in Alberta? Wow. There's and, a I say that, and I say that for the simple reason that we're discovering all of these bass living in all of these provinces that have always said we don't have them. But what they don't have is bass fishing pressure. The minute that there is a little bass fishing pressure, we discover bass in these lakes. Bass didn't just turn up in New Brunswick. Or largemouth didn't just turn up in New Brunswick like Ben would lead us to believe. They've been there for a while. But they're starting to get some intelligent fishing pressure from folks who are targeting bass. So maybe Alberta is one of those. You know, we've never fished for bass in Alberta. Pete, you fished for bass in Saskatchewan because you were told that they were there, but you would never go hunting bass in Saskatchewan, yet there's some huge bass. Beautiful body of water. And you look both surrounding provinces, Manitoba, 
and or uh, BC and uh, Saskatchewan, they both have bass. Both have lots of bass, right? So who knows? You're right. But but if there are no bass in Alberta, which is who knows what the heck, it's probably because they just haven't been introduced there. Most of them in Ontario it was stocked. I'm I'm assuming somehow in that Saskatchewan Lake and Estevan uh, Boundary Dam Reservoir, somehow they got introduced into there. Uh, and Manitoba, maybe the spill off from Ontario. I don't know how that worked. I mean, it was an introduction. Smallmouth bass, for instance, originated in South Africa. Just to let everybody know, that, that's where they came from. So we're thinking, wow, they're a northern fish of Canada. They're South African fish to begin with. So it's been an introduction thing. So I don't know. It's a, that's a great one. Like Ann says, who knows? You're talking about every inch of water has been investigated for bass in that province? No, it hasn't been. So, I mean, yeah, you get incidental catches with pike fishermen. In the shallows, yeah, that's going to happen. And, uh, and you know, the, the walleye guys, you should be able to catch a smallmouth where the walleye live. You should, that, that normally happens. But but who says there's not a small population in a very small number of lakes there? Uh, something to look into, I guess. Uh, Larry Waring says, are you going to, are we going to see Fish in Canada on the new water channel? Well, if I knew what the water channel was, I'd uh, be able to answer that question. I don't even know what that is. Let us know what the water channel is, Larry. We uh, we haven't heard of it. Water channel. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Surprise. Something we haven't heard of. Uh, Tim Sturge, should uh, ever been chased by a bear or moose while out fishing? Uh, chased. Not chased. Not chased, but we were close that time in BC, that one on the Campbell River. Eh? Remember that one that walked right past you and I? Mm. I mean, we could have taken a... I don't know about you, but but that was uh, unnerving, wasn't it? You had a little poo poo in your wetsuit, didn't you? In that one, <laughs> I had a little poo poo in my wetsuit. And you know why? <laughs> you know why? But 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 I'd already kind of figured out uh, a plan of attack because he had cut us off from shore, right? right. He was on the shore, and we were standing out of those rocks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So our escape route had been cut off by that little yeah. duck. Uh, yeah. So. I, I was a little nervous, but I already figured, wh what's the worst that's going to happen? We're going to jump in the river and float down river. I mean, what's the big deal? I always thought he's going to go for the big meal, so I'm good. Uh, <laughs> the bigger I, meal. I always saw, I thought the first thing I'm going to do is trip Pete up and tie him up in this uh, fly rod, <laughs> the fly line, and we're good to go. <laughs> That bear take one bite of me and say, Puh, I don't want that crap. <laughs> There's a great question. With all of the time that we have spent in the wild, all of the years, and I'm not just talking here in Canada, by the way. Yeah. In, in most parts of the world, all the years that Pete and I have traveled and spent time in the wilderness, I can honestly say, with the exception of maybe one or two times, that was one of them, that I ever, you know, feel threatened. And we've been confronted by some pretty scary stuff but i've never felt that wow this was this was it we're we're toast yeah uh, other than maybe one or two times and uh, and but those one or two times we've been we've been on uh, as uh, safaris in africa on several occasions and have actually slept out in the savannah uh in tents hearing growling all around us all night but never really felt that we were threatened and uh the only two times we're, we're both with bear. One of them was grizzly bear up in Brooks Falls in Alaska. Yeah, yeah. And one was this incident in DC with the black bear. Where George Cassidy says, who can swim faster? Peter Ange. <laughs> and you're going to die, buddy. <laughs> All right. I'm dead. Uh, uh, that's funny. <laughs> Anyways, how are we look? What are we looking at? Oh, my God. Yeah, we got to run. Two turning guy. Speaking of. We got to run. A uh, couple of uh, quick notes to uh, leave you with. We uh, have a new hire, a new member of the team will be joining us on August 1st. Um, his name is Mark Weir, and he is going to be in charge of our uh, digital, what was his title, Pete? The digital, um, oh, my God. The, the, the guru, the the. the, the, the the epicenter digital, of digital, digital. Chief, uh, I guess. Uh, Anyways, he's going to be running. A, he's going to be running the uh, digital initiative here, meaning fishingcanada.com. Uh, so you're going to see a lot. And I, I've had the, I've had the opportunity to sit with Mark um, over the last few weeks, and he's kind of unveiled some of his 
uh, thoughts and philosophies and uh, and things that he would like to do. Uh, and I, I got to tell you, I'm really excited as a, a big fan of FishingCanada.com and a big user of FishingCanada.com. I am looking forward to some of the some of the cool stuff that he's going to unveil. Um, his background, by the way, um, he's been uh, 25, 30 years involved in uh, uh, the digital world on behalf of uh, Torstar, um, which uh, owned all 30, kinds of... 30 years in the digital world? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, and I didn't even know it existed. At the very inception. He invented he was, the stuff. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, I got a great story the other day from uh, somebody that you and I both know that also worked for Torstar. Uh, she said that this guy was so good that a lot of the time that he spent in those three decades, he spent doing nothing. The company kept him on on the payroll just so that the competition wouldn't get him because, oh, wow. you know, because the digital evolution hadn't quite kicked in and every day yeah. it was changing. But they knew that that this guy was the real deal. And so she said a lot of the time, he, they, they, they just paid him. Because they didn't want somebody else grabbing it. Wow! Yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm really excited. There's some there's some cool stuff that's gonna. Yeah, he seems like a great guy. Yeah, yeah. So he'll be joining. Uh, well, you know what we should do? We, what, once he's here, we'll bring him on this show and kind of introduce him to everybody. Yeah, and, well, yeah. You could give us uh, give everybody the lowdown on what his plans are and, and and get some input from the people too. You know what I mean? Maybe that's always helpful too. So for sure. Uh, in the interim, I just want to remind you about the FishingCanada.com contest. Uh, it is ongoing and growing every day. It's, uh, massive. It is the most talked about, and, and it's all because of you, uh, the most talked about website in our industry, period. It is, uh, it's crazy what's happening with that site. So uh, we want to thank you. Uh, there's your 10 free entries uh, for the uh, motor giveaway. Boat, motor, and trailer, and motor giveaway. Yes. Now, now I have a question to ask. I ask a simple question. The truth I only wish. Are all fishermen liars or do only liars fish? Ah, see? Thank you for bringing that up. You're welcome. So this week's live bonus code, which is Fish East, is this for 10 entries in both contests or one or the other only? Has anybody ever asked that question? Because I'm asking it now. I bet, I bet it's for both. I They're, bet it's for both. I bet our boys are saying, you know what? We can't do that for just one. They got to be for both. Hello. Hi. Hello, Mike. I'm assuming you're asking me to jump in. <laughs> so, <laughs> unless indicated, the bonus code is just for one contest or the other. But I mean, it's up to you. Should we give them 10 for, for both? If, if I had a say in this, if I had a say, uh, I would say I would like to give it for both. I mean, oh. why would you waste the opportunity? You're giving it's not like you're already giving it away, Mike. Okay, what's what's the difference between ten or twenty? It's done. It's done. Consider it done. Uh, everyone who enters that code will will give you ten bonus entries to each contest. So throw it in each of them. See, I hope I, I, hope I had some part in that. I, I don't know. By the way, uh, this is the lovely. Uh, Michael Mooring, who is the production manager here at Fishing Canada, and uh, he's uh, usually behind every good initiative that we have. Although there's probably guys right now sitting back there saying, "Hey, how about me? How about me?" <laughs> oh, we're not right now, I'm talking to Mike. Okay. I was thinking there when I looked at that uh, Mike's bit, uh, image there, I was thinking, how come he's got a window in his freaking room when there's no windows in this whole place? And then I look behind him, it's that freaking grid they made up. It looks like bars. <laughs> I, didn't know what I, I was embarrassed to, to pose that question because I'm supposed to know everything, but I'm thinking, okay, who the hell ordered the window in Mike's area? <laughs> I didn't sign that. I'll tell you, <laughs> no one you know. authorized uh, sunlight. Yeah, no, no sunlight here. No <laughs> mushroom. Anyway, Thanks, you, uh, it's uh, ten for each contest. So that code is worth ten free ballots for both the motor and the boat motor trailer contest. And if you don't know, you must enter both of them separately. They are not joined. Other than other than you're on fishingcanada.com. Hey, correct the mundo. 
you know what? We'll, we'll quickly reflect. Very one one quick one against the, the fishingcanada.com. Uh, we got those new opening day vast videos on there. We have the two stories about the murders in the fishing world. Okay, you got to check that out on fishingcanada.com. We have a new hotspot that's up. We have uh, Lucas Karen Current Cross in there now. You got to go check out new Lucas's new cool young man's uh, our new talent in there. Uh, my live scope video is now up, and then and said the pro the contest page, and and the other thing we could do is we should let them know what's on Fishing Canada television tomorrow, should we not? Michael can do that for us too, I believe. Couple of firsts, buddy. First shoot of the year, and first shoot with Steve Nizwinki. You got it, bud. <laughs> what's it gonna take to catch these fish? It's a fantastic game, but sometimes it's one of the most frustrating oh. you can get yourself into, man. Oh my God. Whoa! Wow! This is the absolute best. There's not much fishing that's more fun than seeing the fish, getting it in front of them, and having them attack it. Whoa, Steve. Whoa! If you don't go after him, I am. <laughs> that was a fun show, man. That was a, that's a fishing opportunity for you Ontario people. The Southern Ontario uh, GTA people, that's not far. That's Perry Sound, and there's loaded with these escapee rainbow trout. There's a, it's a fishery that you uh, anybody that does it would enjoy it. Trolling or casting, very easy, uh, delicious eating fish, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they're not supposed to be there, but they is. <laughs> The only thing that I noticed in that little clip was you were all bundled up, toque and everything else, and gloves and everything going. And Steve looks like he's in midsummer form out there. Oh, he's one of those. He's one of those guys that wears shorts in the winter. Okay, Don't, let's, let's be honest. The guy is like a bear. He's unbelievable. So yeah. he's a tough bugger. I'm a wimp, and he's tough. That's the truth. Okay. It was a wonderful episode. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, and you're right. Close to the GTA. Uh, great. Uh, uh, and wonderful eating fish, by the oh, way. Man. We kept one each, and, then, and I talked to him about it. He says, was yours as good as mine? It was delicious. It was yeah, really yeah. that was that good. So, All right, well, that's it. We got to get out of here. We're going to get – somebody's going to get the hook and pull us off the stage. I want to thank everybody, uh, our special guest, Ben Wu, uh, for uh, coming on during, uh, you know, maybe difficult situations for him to try and explain what uh, – what happened? We'll hear more about it as the time uh, goes by. I'm sure as the, the investigation goes on. Uh, hopefully, we'll find out what happened and get to uh, the bottom of it all. And uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Uh, another week, another dollar. Uh, everybody, stay safe. Get out there. Have a great weekend in the outdoors. Take care. See you, everybody.